native New Yorker, if you haven't figured that out yet, from Brooklyn, New York. I lived and worked in Manhattan for about uh, 19 years, 20 years, when I was a faculty member and administrator at Fordham University. And then uh, less than two years ago, I'll have my two-year anniversary this August, I arrived in Spokane, Washington, uh, at Gonzaga University, a very, very similar city to New York City um, in, all, in all ways. Still, still reeling from that culture shock, and at times I do wake up in the morning and say, how did I get here, or what am I doing here? But, um, but it has given me the opportunity to come to California uh, often, and I really do enjoy being here, and, and Jenny uh, Jones and I have been communicating since I arrived a couple of years ago. And uh, so I'm really glad to be back, and I'll take you through CAC theory, cross-battery assessment, SLD identification, and I'll introduce you to the XBAS, which is the, it's actually the latest uh, evolution of, of our work, cross-battery assessment. I'll show you some videos at the end so you can get a sense of what that looks like. But um, since we have a range of uh, skill set in here, a skill level about cross-battery, we're going to probably do a little bit of basic, a little intermediary, and then I'll give you that introduction to the XBAS, which is kind of advanced. Okay? So we're good to go? All right. This is like a religious service. Nobody wants to sit up front. Everybody is kind of in the middle or in the back, but that's okay. I don't bite. If you do want to come up, if you can't see the screen, um, feel free to come on up. So today we will take a look at CHC theory. I know you're probably all familiar with the theory, but I'll review it and maybe give you some updates on the theory. We'll talk about the relations between CHC abilities and academic uh, function or academic skills. This is very important because this helps knowledge of these relationships um, assist you in determining you know, what constructs do you need to measure for a particular reason for referral, a student who has a you know, particular difficulty, a learning problem. So I'll give you some information uh, on that. We'll take a look at um, cross-battery assessment, what it is, what it isn't, um, a little bit of the history, but we'll, I'll give you pretty much the, the current state of affairs with that. What's new uh, to cross-battery assessment approach, that's basically in the book, if you have the book, Essentials of Cross-Battery Assessment, third edition. I will be covering um, uh, that, uh, those, those areas in this topic here, what's new to cross-battery assessment, and then introduce you to the DEMIA, or the Data Management and Interpretive Assistant. That's one of the software programs that comes with the book. Um, do they still have the disc in the book, the CD in the back? Okay. There was um, talk about removing that when, when XBAS um, was going to be released, but I think they decided to keep that in there because um, there's some overlap with the XBAS, but also, um, for example, on the XBAS, the newest software system, we have the WISC-5, the WJ-4. Those tests are not um, on, the, in the, on the disc that comes with the book, but many of you are still using the WISC-4, right? Still using the WISC-4, or you've gone to WISC-5? Okay, what about WJ-3, still using WJ-3? Oh, so you're pretty good. Some, some districts around the country are still using the old instruments, but those, if you were to use those um, older versions, they're on the CD, so you have, you have both. Uh, and then we will take a look at our um, SLD identification model or method, which is dual discrepancy consistency, operational definition. I'll take a, we'll take a look at the PSWA, Pattern of Strengths and Weaknesses Analyzer, which is a program that's a little bit complicated, but um, once you understand it, I think it'll make sense. And that assists you in determining whether the student um, has a learning disability or not. Does it make a decision for you? Just provides you with information that helps you make that decision. And then um, the importance of individual differences and differential diagnosis. Um, we're firm believers in individual differences that you know all children, even if they've got similar uh, profiles or strengths and weaknesses, they still learn differently and they may need different interventions based on, uh, based on their skill set and um, prior interventions. And then I'll give you a brief introduction to the XBAS, probably through some slides, but also through some tutorial videos that we've been preparing that I don't even think are released um, online yet, but I'll give you <laughs> a, a little peek into that, okay? There's something like 280 plus slides in the handout. 
and I'm only, I'm not covering all of those, as you can imagine. Um, I'm not sure how many, I think maybe I'm covering 200 or so. But I put a, additional slides just for your review. They're all at the back, the end of the presentation or your handout, so that you have them. Um, there's some more XBAS slides, there's WISC-5 slides, WJ-4 slides. There's a WISC-5 case study that was done with the XBAS. So you have all of those. I won't be reviewing them because we don't have time, but I just put them in there for you so you can have them. Okay, so CHC theory. Um, you're all familiar with CHC theory, right? Cattell, Horn, Carroll theory, um, which uh, today basically most, uh, most IQ tests and even some achievement batteries are um, developed based on CHC theory. For us, it helps us in guiding test interpretation, and it is a foundation for cross-battery assessment. So cross-battery assessment is based, the theory that guides cross-battery assessment is CAC theory. It's probably, um, you know, made it into the main, into mainstream school psychology, um, you know, pretty, pretty much at this point in time. Uh, it also, the theory also helps us in achieving uh, or in getting to a, um, a cognitive ability processing achievement link um, in facilitating SLD identification. And um, CHC-based cognitive assessment informs diagnosis and intervention. So the theory helps us not only with uh, assisting in diagnosing SLD, but also in what kinds of interventions can we come up with uh, based on a person's uh, per pattern of strengths and weaknesses. Okay. So CHC theory and the relations among cognitive uh, abilities, processes, and academic skills. So um, nine of the ten factors from uh, 2000 to 2011 were refined in a chapter by Schneider and McGrew in 2012, and then there were some additional refinements in the WJ4 technical manual. Um, this is. Uh, that's Raymond Cattell, John Horn, his uh, student, uh, his protege, his mentee. And uh, this is basically GFGC theory right here. So there were um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There were about 10 uh, broad abilities over here. Some of the codes and some of the names back then differ from the ones that, today, that we have today. But uh, the ones that we have today, I'll show you mom momentarily. You'll see them. Then in 1993, John Carroll produced or uh, published his Human Cognitive Abilities book and his Three Stratum Theory of Cognitive Abilities. Basically, the main difference between uh, John Carroll and um, Cattell and Horn uh, is this right here, the G or general intelligence. The other fellows didn't think that G or general intelligence uh, really existed, but rather was an artifact of statistical analyses. But bottom line is, uh, for those of you who are G people, G uh, is important. Overall score on an IQ test or a cognitive ability test is still used, right, for, for differential diagnosis of intellectual disability, giftedness, and in SLD. And it is still highly predictive of, G that is, highly predictive of job success and um, graduating high school, financial, um, financial compensation and many other variables. So G is important. It's just that when it comes to intervention, specific interventions for students who are having learning difficulties, G may not be that important. GA, auditory processing may be important, GLR or GSM, long-term retrieval, short-term memory respectively, they may be more important than that overall G score. But for certain diagnoses, it is important. And I always advocate giving a full IQ test um, you know, for, for, most, for most students because I think it's important to have a good idea. Plus, parents oftentimes want to know what, what's my child's IQ, how did he or she perform. So I think it is important. And you've got a variety of tests out there now that you can give so, um, uh, for, for an overall IQ score. And then in, uh, in the late 90s, uh, Kevin McGrew and some others basically uh, had uh, integrated GFGC and the three stratum theory of cognitive abilities. And this is the sort of a framework, if you will, of CHC theory through um, about 2011, okay? These uh, on the left here, this column, these are the broad abilities, okay, or the middle stratum, 
And then these rectangles in different colors are narrow abilities. The way that I describe these, broad abilities are sort of like indexes, right? Like a VCI is really GC or crystallized intelligence. If you have a fluid reasoning index like the, on the new uh, WISC-5, that's really a GF, right? So these broad abilities over here are akin to indexes or clusters or factors. And then these, um, sub, these are like subtests. These narrow abilities, they're like subtests. So when you have a measure, let's say, of um, VL, which is lexical knowledge, um, so you take any vocabulary test on any IQ, on an IQ battery, it's going to be a measure of VL or lexical knowledge. So that's kind of like the subtest level. These here, narrow abilities, and these, again, broad abilities are like indexes or clusters or factors, if you will. So that's what guided um, our test development interpretation actually till 2011. This is what we have today, uh, which is um, a much broader CHC theory. Now we have 16 broad abilities, 16 and approximately 80 narrow abilities or, again, subtests, if you will. The, sh the difference in the color and the shading is that um, in the kind of reddish color, pinkish color here, these, these narrow abilities we find on several of our IQ and achievement batteries. The ones in the gray, um, the gray color, we don't find them on too many batteries, if, if any at all. So really, in reality, there's about nine broad abilities and 35 narrow abilities represented on current, uh, current batteries. The, the, uh, the additional broad abilities and narrow abilities that came out in 2012, they were still, they were a part of Carroll's thinking in 1990, in his book, 1993 book, but the difference uh, is that they really weren't talked about. So I guess McGrew and Snyder, uh, Schneider and McGrew decided that they would, um, you know, uncover them from the model and add them. They are mostly sensory and motor kinds of abilities. So you have go, or geo, which is olfactory, okay, so how well you smell. Not that you smell, but you know, how well you can detect odors. OM is olfactory memory. So anybody who works in, uh, let's say, the wine industry or beer industry or uh, fragrances probably has to have good geo. Um, and GH, which is, I believe, tactile, uh, tactile skills, uh, GK, kinesthetic, so there are um, about six, six broad abilities that were added, but they're basically sensory motor, and we don't find them on our IQ test or achievement test. But you will find some of them on the NEPSI 2. You'll find them, anybody use the Dulles Kaplan executive function system? No one uses the DCAFs? Yeah, a few people. So a lot of uh, measures on that instrument fall under sensory motor, you'll see. And something called the Dean Woodcock neuroassessment uh, yeah, neuro battery that one as well. So you won't see too many of them, but they are present in the model and some of them are important, but I think they're more for folks who've been through traumatic brain injury and have um, uh, motor difficulties and so on. Okay, so I'll take you through the different, uh, the different CHC abilities at the broad and narrow level, but I'll do it rather quickly. So GF, GF is um, one of the most important broad abilities. G, some people think that GF is G, that they're one and the same. In fact, in some studies, GF and G are, um, uh, are it's called unity. So basically, they're like co correlated at 1.0. So they're like one and the same. So GF is very important. I'll speak more about that as we go along. The three, um, the three that we, we talk about most are induction, general sequential reasoning, which is also known as deduction, and quantitative reasoning. There were a couple of other ones from the past, um, but they've been de-emphasized because there was little evidence that they're distinct uh, factors. So what is fluid ability? For me, fluid ability very simply is thinking. It's really just the ability to think, to reason, to solve problems, especially the uh, problems that we haven't seen before. Okay, almost any time you're doing a matrix test or a matrix analogies test, we're using um, our fluid ability or our fluid reasoning uh, mostly. 
Okay, so it is, uh, it's, a, it's clearly an important ability. It, it becomes more important in academics as we get more towards end of second grade, third grade, fourth grade, when the work becomes more complex. We're asking our students to think more, to solve problems, um, inferential, uh, solving inferential questions from reading comprehension. When we ask them to write a story, okay, those kinds of ta academic tasks, that's where GF is really coming into play. In kindergarten, first grade, not so much, okay, but really I guess at the end of second, third grade, that's when we start to see um, GF really playing an important role. Um, so, as I just said, GF, both induction and deduction, uh, play a moderate role in reading comprehension. So when, if, you're, if your student has a problem with reading comprehension, you definitely want to be able to assess the person's fluid ability or fluid reasoning. Um, when it comes to uh, math achievement, quantitative reasoning, or RQ, is the most important narrow ability under GF. And basically, quantitative reasoning, or RQ, is simply um, using inductive and deductive reasoning with, with, not, with numbers and uh, mathematical functions, okay? So quantitative reasoning becomes important or is important for math. And then, as I said, induction and deduction are consistent and related to, to written expression. So, you know, the ability, having a student, the student's ability to plan, to um, come up with a story that, you know, has a beginning, a middle, and end, that is not just really descriptive of, let's say, a picture, but actually has, um, has some substance to it. And as we know, if you, if you assess children's writing, it's very difficult to evaluate their writing uh, on our instruments, our tests, so um, it's not an easy task. But GF is definitely involved. In a recent study, I added this slide, it's not in your packet, I just added this one. Uh, in a recent study by Blanche, 2015, he evaluated the contributions of GF and GC in the performance of a one-week instructional process with a data set applying a latent curve model. Basically, what, what he showed was that GF had a significant direct influence in the rate of learning. So it was a neat little study um, where uh, learning took place over a one-week period, and he showed in a very sophisticated manner how GF had a direct influence in the rate of learning. It also had an indirect, uh, or was an indirect meaningful predictor of the final learning performance when acting through uh, GC. So GF is very important for rate, but also for actual, uh, the actual product. Uh, nevertheless, GC is really um, what's important in terms of what we know uh, as facts and uh, general information. So GF is, is critical. And when I, when I finish GC, I'll tell you um, how GF and GC um, go together and how, how really how uh, important they are. So we turn to GC. GC is crystallized intelligence. Basically, for me, I, I think of you know, Alex Trebek. If you think of Alex Trebek and you think of Jeopardy, or you think of Trivial Pursuit, or any of those information games where you have to you know, tap your long-term memory, it's a little bit more than that um, because it is language development and it's culture and it's um, society's values and so on. But basically, GC is what we've learned. You know, what we've learned primarily from formal schooling, but also just from you know, the world around us. When, when our students go on field trips, they go to museums, they go to cultural uh, activities. You know, having grown up in, in New York City and Brooklyn, um, for decades and then living in Manhattan, my GC, you would think my GC would be better than it is, but uh, you know, you just kind of never know how much you know, right? Because you get GC from reading and just from everyday life. I always tell the story that when I, I how I kind of learned to read and how I kind of learned about uh, my environment was um, my parents would always take me on the, anybody been to New York? Okay, so you've been on the subway system, right? Okay. Well, you probably weren't there in the 70s when it was god-awful, and um, there was graffiti everywhere. But I was able to learn how to read, in part, from reading graffiti on the walls in the subways, um, but also on the placards and the signs that were in the subway cars, right? That's, that's kind of how I learned, because my parents would read to me what was on, on those placards, and, and I really um, got an education that way. So <laughs> I did, believe me. 
Um, so GC is really that accumulated knowledge, and it never stops, right? So GC, you know, as long as you know we're we're intact, we continue to learn um, as we age. Whereas um, GF, you know, kind of starts to you know tail off a little bit um, as we get older, and and certain um, you know neurocognitive functions start to you know give us a difficulty. But anyway, so GC is important among. The narrow ability is most important would be this one. This is K0, or general verbal information, and lexical knowledge, which is vocabulary development or, or just vocabulary, right? Um, so if you, that's why on a lot of um, standardized instruments or national tests like the SAT and others, there's always vocabulary there because it's a very good predictor of academic success and, and just you know, higher functioning. So it's very important. <laughs> um, here are some others, listening ability, communication ability, and grammatical sensitivity. These you'll find more on, I'd say, on language instruments. So speech pathologists probably are tapping into these narrow abilities. Occasionally, you'll see them on a, an achievement test in um, like the KT3 or perhaps the, um, not so much the WJ4, maybe the, um, the Wyatt. So, you know, basically what is, I just told you what it is, it's basically a fund of information built over time. Um, it's your own personal uh, library or everything, you know. So what's that statement that uh, information is power or something like that, right? So it's like who gets the information first or who learns about the, the newest whatever that's out there. Um, so it's what you know, it's your personal library. Um, Word games, you know, that's another way of, of actually building up GC or a way of uh, increasing our, our vocabulary and so on. So wh basically, GC is important throughout the lifetime and it's important for all academic areas, for reading, writing, math, and language, I might add. So it, these kinds of abilities are uh, very important. They become more important with age. GC is a, a big predictor of uh, reading comprehension as well over the ages. It is, you just cannot really, really ha cannot survive in school if you don't have GC. Um, and same thing with GF. GF and GC are the, basically the two, I'll say some controversial things today. Um, I think I mean, they're my opinion, they're based on research, of course, but um, GF and GC, when, when students have low GF and GC, they're in trouble. They're going to have, a, a, not only are they not learning, they're going to have more difficulty learning than most other students. Um, folks or individuals, individual, um, sorry, um, um, intellectual disability, Think about it, their GF and their GC are pretty low, right? They may have a little bit of a spike in processing speed maybe, or maybe in some like visual memory, they may have an idiosyncratic strength in one of those areas. But basically, those folks who have uh, intellectual disability, we used to call that mental retardation, their GF and GC, those, those are the two basic abilities that are uh, deficit functioning. You know, and they're the ones that lead to those IQs around 70 or below 70. They have an extremely difficult time thinking. They can't think. They also haven't learned uh, as much information, be um, primarily because of GF, but also because of other, um, other deficits. So GF and GC, you cannot underestimate the importance of those. They are the best predictors of overall academic achievement. And when, that, when one or both of those areas is uh, a deficit area, that student's going to have a very, very difficult time learning. The more intact GF and GC, the greater the probability that the student can learn and will benefit from interventions, OK? There are folks out there who don't like to hear this because it sounds like we're saying if you don't have GF and GC, you can't learn. We're not saying that saying that it's going to be extremely difficult for those folks. And maybe, just maybe, if we can accept the fact that not everybody has to be a doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief, or you know, has to be a CEO of a company, but you, know, you all need carpenters, plumbers, electricians, right, mechanics. You know, we really need to kind of be thinking about that for folks who may um, 
not have the highest GF and GC because academics and academic at college and post post uh, college degrees are not for everybody. But we seem to have a difficult time accepting that in our society. But anyway, um, this will come into play when I get to PSW patterns of strengths and weaknesses because um, what, what I'm going to show you is that the lower the GF and the lower the GC the, uh, again, the more intense the intervention is going to have to be uh, in order for students to achieve. So, okay, so in terms of math and writing, it's basically the same thing. GC, some people think that GC is academic achievement, and to some degree it is, right? It's what you've learned, what we've learned. Um, so it's important for reading, writing, and math. Uh, and then back to that study, the Blanche study, 2015, um, all I want to point out is that GC had a significant impact on the final learning performance. That's, that study is kind of complicated. I only put it up here because it's very recent, 2015, and it just adds evidence that GF is important for rate of learning and GC is uh, important for what is actually learned or assessing what's learned. So. Um, Again, it's just more evidence that these abilities are important. So now we move on to GA, which is still not assessed by most of our IQ tests. The WJ4 certainly has several measures of GA. Um, one of my favorite instruments that really is not talked about or used very often is differential ability scales, second edition, sometimes known as the DAS. Anybody use it? Oh, good. So a few people, do you like it? Yeah. I think it's really, I think it's probably the best test out there, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, when Pearson owns the world and they own the, what do they own? The WISC, KBC, you know, KT, Wyatt, whatever they own, um, they're not going to, they don't market the DAS2 very much. But it's really a good instrument. That has a, a phonological processing test on a GA test. That's why I was mentioning that. Those are the only two IQ tests that I know of that have GA on them. Um, most people supplement with the CTOP or CTOP2. I don't know if you give those, speech pathologists give those. Um, there's a colleague of mine, uh, David Kilpatrick, up at SUNY Cortland in New York, and he's a big fan of the CTOP2. Says any student, any student who's having a reading problem or having difficulties in learning how to read, he gives the CTOP2 because he gains a lot of information from it. So not plugging any te test in particular, but the CTOP seems to be the leader, lead test in terms of um, auditory processing. So we have several uh, narrow abilities under GA, phonetic coding, speech sound discrimination, et cetera. Phonetic coding is the one that you're going to see uh, measured by many of, um, well, many of our tests that we do have measure um, phonetic coding as the narrow ability under GA. Oops. So what is it? It's basically the ability to perceive, analyze, and synthesize a variety of auditory information. It's interesting because, you know, for decades in the 70s, 80s, and even into the early 90s, we were classifying students as having a reading disability and we weren't assessing their auditory processing when reading disability to a large extent is an auditory processing difficulty. It's more of the phonological awareness or phonemic awareness aspect of, of GA, but we weren't assessing it yet. We were classifying kids as having a reading disability and we weren't even assessing. We were assessing, we tended to think that visual processing was the culprit. Visual processing is a culprit in reading disability or in, in learning how to read or having difficulties in learning how to read, but not in the way that we typically measure visual processing. It's not through building blocks or putting blocks together or triangles together or any of those kinds of things. It's more orthographic processing, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Um, nevertheless, GA is important, especially phonetic or phonological uh, awareness kinds of, of tests or tasks. Um, it's really critical. So, um, I just said that. GA is very important during the elementary school years and learning how to read. It's also important in uh, writing as well. It's not so important in math. And if you think about it, especially in beginning math, GA isn't that important. So, if your student has been uh, referred for a math problem, you don't necessarily have to give GA. But if it's part of the battery and you've given it anyway, 
and you can highlight it perhaps as a strength or you know something that the child excels in then then why not but it might not be necessary if the student is referred for math okay Question. yes It, it depends. So like GF is, is more important for higher level reading, for reading comprehension and written expression. For basic reading, reading um, GF isn't so important. GA is important. Um, short term memory is important. Processing speed are, is important. And, and this thing called orthographic processing, which has always been around but just not paid too much attention to. So it really depends on what skill, you know, skill we're talking about. Um, but GF, GF definitely for the applications, okay, including, you know, um, word problems in math, those kinds of things. But for the basic skill development, it's more of the, the like the G, the short, the memory, the auditory processing, which tend to be um, lower on the brain stem, and then the GF, the thinking, which is really, you know, the, the neocortex, um, is really for the applied kinds of skills. But that, thank you, it's a good question. Um, with, so I just said this, um, GA again, phonetic coding important for, for writing achievement. Um, so assessing phonological processing related to reading. Here are just examples of, of actually now this slide is a little outdated because we've got the KT3 which does have phonological awareness on it. Um, the WJ4, not the WJ3, but DAS2, CTOP2, uh, PAL2, all these instruments have phonological processing subtests or tasks on them. They're important to, to assess, okay? Um, there's a new one, a new cognitive test on the WJ4. By the way, what's, the, what's your take on the WJ4? Good, bad, similar to what it was? Similar, right? I think it's more, probably more similar than not. Um, many of the subtests were renamed. And then there are a few new subtests, but I think for the most part it's kind of similar. Um, I think the WISC-5 is actually pretty different from the, really any other of the WISCs, actually. And um, seems to be a pretty good instrument, especially with the addition of GLR on there. So the only ability that's missing on the, I shouldn't say the only, one of the important abilities that's missing on the WISC-5 is GA, but you can get that from the Wyatt or you can get aspects of GA from the Y. You can also um, obviously give the CTOP2 or talk to your speech language pathologist about GA. But, um, but yeah, if you have the WJ4 or the WISC-5, you're pretty much set with the core battery and then you can supplement from there and I'll talk to you more about that. But anyway, there's a phonological processing on the WJ4. Um, I just added this slide too. It's not. It's not in your. Um, it's not in that handout because I was thinking about it and I was like, well, maybe I should talk a little bit more about phonological skills. But um, there is a difference between phonics and phonological awareness or phonemic awareness. So I learned via phonics when I was in kindergarten. I learned the sound le, uh, sound symbol relationships, right? And I still use phonics. I mean, you know, there's uh, every time I come across a word, I can't. I don't know, I'm not familiar with, it's not my sight vocabulary. I use old phonics skills, right? So they're still very important and very good. Um, but phonological awareness is really a much more complex uh, construct, if you will. That has to do really with um, our manipulations of language, okay? And our, it's, it's a cognitive skill, and that's why we can teach it, right? It has to do with segmentation and blending, deletion, substitution, reversal of phonemes. So it's that manipulation of words and the manipulation of language versus phonics, which is basically, you know, it takes more time, right? When you're sounding out a word, it takes time to do that. Um, and it helps us with, you know, determining unfamiliar words. It's a very basic skill. It's a good one to have. But what research has shown is that when we have interventions that are based on phonics alone, we don't get, those students don't make great gains or they don't make um, many gains. You have to have phon phonological awareness training 
um, which has to do with these other kinds of skills. And then it becomes, they're automatic. They become, it's where, it's where the reading becomes, <coughs> excuse me, automatic. And it's based on phonological awareness. So phonological awareness programs are really the way to go when you've got struggling readers. Um, or you have phonics plus phonological awareness. But phonics alone, especially those who are really struggling in learning how to read, is not going to be enough. Um, there has to be that, that phonological awareness. And so there is a difference between the two. They're related, um, but they are, they are su sufficiently different as well. So that uh, gentleman I mentioned, David Kilpatrick, you should look out for his name. He's, anybody see him on the, anybody belong to NASP communities? No? You ever see his name on there? It's, NASP communities is, um, can be overwhelming, but if you join NASP communities, it's like a blog. You know, it's a listserv, and every day there, um, there's a whole, you know, there could be two or three and maybe as many as 10 or 12, um, uh, I guess, you know, blogs or, or back and forth about a particular topic, whether it's a new instrument or identification of, of a particular disorder <coughs> or so on. But, um, so David Kilpatrick is oftentimes on that NASP communities. And he really, really is the rising star in the assessment, not in the assessment, well, in the assessment of reading and understanding um, reading disability. And I'll talk more about him um, a little bit later. But anyway, he really espouses a CTOP2 and phonological awareness screening test, which is out of print. It's not in print. Um, and, but he swears by it. And he was a practicing school psychologist for decades. And he has assessed you know, hundreds, if not maybe a couple of thousand students. And so he, um, you know, he really has advanced his, his thinking in the assessment of reading and, and um, specific learning disability. He'll be coming out with an essentials book, like the book that you have from us. Um, and uh, so keep an eye on it, out on it. I think it's going to really make, make your lives easier. Um, yes, I do. I, I'll just have to look them up at the break and then I can give them to you. But there are, um, Road to the Code is one. Um, there, are, uh, uh, there are others, yeah. Uh, but that, that's, that really is the, the way to go, um, is phonological awareness. Okay. So GSM, or short-term memory, uh, these, Memory span and working memory capacity. Uh, memory span is just, you know, basically like remembering a phone number, which we don't do anymore, right? Because you've got, we've got our smartphones that remember everything for us. How many of you know your own cell number? You know your cell phone number? Wow, that's, that's good. So we're more traditionalists in the audience, but some people don't even know their cell, their cell phone number. Um, but I bet you many of you remember one of your um, landline numbers when you were growing up, right? Because it was drilled into us. Um, and so that's memory span. Working memory capacity is that manipulation of information, or we transform that information, typically, you know, mentally. So even when you're doing mental arithmetic, that is really working memory. Uh, or uh, you're familiar with all of the kind of working memory tasks, whether it's um, you know letter number sequencing or you know um, uh, number object sequencing or any other kind of where you're given stimuli, two different types of stimuli, you have to rework the stimuli in your head, and then produce a response. Working memory, by the way, is important for um, higher level skills as well, especially reading comprehension and um, higher and uh, written expression working memory is very, uh, very important. So I just told you what short-term memory is and what working memory is as well. So they're both important. Um, okay, so a child with short-term memory difficulties may have a difficult time or a hard time following directions, spelling, sounding out words, um, etc. cetera. And, um, but we have a lot of memory interventions that are out there, okay? There's an essentials book on, on memory by Milt Den, D-E-H-N. 
I, I haven't read it, but just telling you that there's a book out there on memory, so it might be helpful to you. Um, we have all kinds of strategies for helping uh, kids with short-term memory difficulties. Um, the, the relation between short-term memory and achievement, basically memory span and working memory capacity are important at all ages, right? So from the get-go when children are learning, you know, academics, whether it's preschool or kindergarten or first grade, whenever they're exposed to those academic, uh, initial academic tasks, memory, working memory and memory span are important um, and they continue to be important throughout, um, throughout development. Okay, so they're important for reading, math and writing. Okay, um, you're going to see in the WJ4 materials, a little bit of a twist there. Uh, Dr. McGrew has basically changed uh, short-term memory, GSM, to short-term working memory, or GWM. Um, it's basically the same definition, the ability to apprehend and hold information in immediate awareness and use it within a few seconds. Uh, and, and then GWM is further defined as efficiency of attentional control. Um, the WJ4 working memory tasks measure the capacity limits of short-term working memory. So you're just going to see some different terminology out there in terms of working memory. Instead of GSM, you're going to see GWM on the WJ4. We, um, Cross Battery folks, we toyed with this back and forth with the XBAS because we were going to change everything to GWM and then we decided not to at this point in time and keep everything as GSM, which is short-term memory, and then there's two types, memory span and working memory, until we have additional uh, data and research to suggest um, that we should change it from GSM to GWM. But effectively, they're pretty much the same. Working memory capacity um, and working memory are the same thing, and for now, we're going to have the two different narrow abilities. But I just, we put this slide in our work because we want people to be aware that we are aware that um, there's some different thinking about, uh, about GSM and GWM. GLR, <clears throat> which um, you know, for a long time was a broad ability that wasn't assessed by many of our cognitive batteries. It was always assessed by the WJ people, so give them credit for that. That was definitely a good thing and um, primarily uh, associative memory or the ability to remember previously unrelated information as having uh, been paired. Uh, but there's also meaningful memory, free recall memory. These constitute like a subcategory called learning efficiency, all right, learning efficiency. GLR is apparently or should, is, should be considered one of the more important broad abilities to assess because it's kind, of the, it's kind of the learning ability, if you will, um, especially when it comes to, to reading. So it doesn't really say that in the definition, the ability to store, consolidate, and retrieve information over periods of time, measured in minutes, hours, days, and years. It doesn't really convey, I think, exactly what it is. But when you understand the tasks that we ask kids to do, um, so like associative memory, that's, those are like Atlantis and Rebus and visual auditory learning, the pairing of a pictograph or a Rebus with a letter or with a word, you know, that's all GLR and it's very important. Dick Woodcock uh, said, basically has said that he thinks in terms of um, ac early academic learning, GLR is probably the most important broad ability to assess in those beginning years. So it probably is something that we should be taking a look at. Took the Wexler people, well, they're not really Wexler people, but it took the Psychological Corporation a long time to incorporate GLR, but it has. Here's the, not a problem, but GLR on the WISC-5 is only one ability, it's associative memory. There's no other um, narrow ability, GLR narrow ability on the WISC-5. The only one is MA or associative memory. There's three subtests for it, but they're basically measuring the same narrow ability. So if you were looking to have a broad ability assessment of GLR on the WISC-5, you're going to have to step out of the battery and find another, uh, another measure. Um, so just, just letting you know. But 
Um, these other these other skills uh, or abilities, narrow abilities, are important as well. Then we have a, it, a second subcategory of GLRs, retrieval fluency. You're probably pretty familiar with ideational fluency. Basically, if you ask somebody to name as many animals in a minute, or foods, or you know anything along the categories, things like that, um, that's Ide Oops, sorry. That's ideational fluency here, FI, the ability to rapidly produce a series of ideas, words, or phrases related to a condition or object. Um, that's getting, it's kind of, it's getting at the lexical access, speed of lexical access, um, being able to get at information that's in long-term memory, and we all know people who have a difficult time expressing themselves or getting the words out, even though you know, they know it, you know they know it, but can't express it and can't get that to that information. So that's a GLR problem. That's a retrieval problem. Um, perhaps, I guess, other than associative memory on the previous slide, naming facility is probably the second uh, most important narrow ability under GLR. So naming facility, also known as RAN or Rapid Automatized Naming, RAN tasks, again, you know, in, in our field, in education, uh, broadly speaking, you know, what goes around comes around. We've known since the 70s that RAN is important. The ability to rapidly name colors, letters, numbers, um, simple objects, to be able to name them quickly, again, getting at the access, automaticity. We've known that that's been important for a long time, but it's only been in maybe the last, you know, 10 years that it's, it's come back into, uh, in, into our thinking. So now you see lots of NA tasks on, on our tests, okay? You'll see uh, RAN tasks on the CTOP as well, but definitely on the WJ. Uh, it's also now on the WISC-V. Um, there's, there's actually, um, uh, is it now on the WISC-V? Yeah, naming, what is it, uh, letter naming? Yeah, the quantity. Well, actually, that falls under, under GS. Um, and then the letter, the letter naming one would be uh, a measure. So actually you do have uh, more than one GLR measure on, uh, on the WISC-V. So you, you don't have to go out of battery, you actually have the two. Okay. Um, so basically, here's just a little uh, slide of, you know, going from that to that. Um, right? It's kind of the organization going from this to this. And it's not what's stored in long-term memory or what you know, but it's the process of storing and retrieving that information. So it's how you get to that information, making associations, and that's why it's important for learning how to read. So it's on the tip of my tongue uh, phenomenon, okay? So here's just an example of retrieval difficulties um, with GLR. So when we ask students, let's say, to name a picture, um, and this is a real case, this particular student had difficulty, couldn't come up with that precise one word answer f to name a picture, right, through a, a picture vocabulary test. Um, but when given a more, I guess, uh, a task where the person could actually say a lot, you, you've worked with these kids, right? They, they'll get the answer, but it takes them a long time to get there, but you give them credit, right, because they do come up with the answer, but they can't give you that succinct, you know, really clear, clear uh, cut response. Uh, but when you give them a little bit more leeway, a little bit more room to actually, you know, define a word, then sometimes they, they get credit. And then you could have the opposite, where they can't do this very well, because they don't have good expressive language skills, but they might be able to name pictures pretty well. So you have all different kinds of kids. But, um, but in any case, um, those who cannot come up with you know, direct answers in a, in a precise way um, may have retrieval uh, difficulties. So it, it's important to measure. And as I said, um, GLR, naming facility, and associative memory, these are the two narrow abilities that are most important for reading math and writing, uh, especially that rapid automa automatic naming. You have to, you should be giving some kinds of uh, RAN tasks in your battery if a child is young and having difficulties in, in learning. 
Here we come to GV, which is basically visual processing or the ability to make use of simulated mental imagery. Um, it's sometimes been called the mind's eye, right? Basically, the visualization is the skill or the narrow ability under GV that most of our IQ tests measure. So this is, uh, you know, block design, spatial relations, uh, triangles from the KBC. I mean, um, visualization, which is important, but not really for reading, writing, and math. Visualization skills really are more important for um, uh, geometry, algebra, well, maybe not algebra, but definitely geometry. If, um, if you're going to be an architect, if you're going to be an engineer, those kinds, of, if you want to park your car, <laughs> um, that's, you know, spatial relations, um, parallel parking, which I don't think you have too much out here, but um, in, uh, in a city like New York, definitely parallel parking. Um, highly associated with road rage, by the way, when you try to <laughs> see people parking and they can't do it and they're holding up traffic. But anyway, visual, that's what visualization is. It's not really that important for reading, writing, and math. Not, not in terms of learning, the beginning learning. It's really, again, more higher level and very specific kinds of tasks. Um, I'd say visual memory is important. Um, among the narrow abilities on GV in terms of maybe in terms of learning, visual memory might be, uh, might be important because if you think about it, we have visual memory classified under GV, but it could also be classified under short-term memory. So, um, so it is a memory function and I think it's important for that. Um, okay, so I'll just skip over these because they basically said all of this. Okay. But in terms of where GV really comes into play, and it's not really a part of uh, CHC theory, is orthography or orthographical uh, processing, or orthographic processing. We're thinking of coining this OP, you know, orthographic processing um, as, a, as a code in CAC theory, but we, we, haven't, we haven't done it yet, but we're just thinking about that. And um, so orthography, this is just one definition, it's not a great definition, but uh, the system of marks that make up the English language, including upper and lower case letters, numbers, and punctuation marks. Um, orth sometimes uh, orthography is defined as spelling, and that's true, and um, students can have a disability in spelling. I mean, they, it, it really, they really can. It's usually not limited to spelling, but they can have a disability, a, a specific learning disability in spelling. Now, IDEA doesn't, ha doesn't have a category of spelling. It's, there's only one for, um, for writing, and that's written expression. But you could classify a student as having an SLD um, in spelling. But again, typically, that's not the only academic area that's affected. There's usually some kind of reading that's affected as well. But, Orthography is spelling um, and includes um, uh, the definition here as well. And so visual processing must be assessed using letters, words, and numbers rather than abstract designs or familiar uh, pictures. Okay, so there are a couple of tasks on the new WJ, on the WJ4 that really are tapping orthographic processing. There are tasks on some of our other batteries that are tapping into it um, as well. So this is just a summary slide. Visualization is important for math achievement, especially for geometry, calculus, higher level kinds of tasks. But in terms of reading and writing, it's this orthographic processing uh, that's important, not the way we traditionally have measured GV on our IQ test. Okay? So what are some of the batteries or tests out there that are getting at orthographic processing? Here are some of them. Test of silent word reading fluency, um, test of irregular word reading uh, efficiency, the TOC, test of orthographic competence. That's the first test that I know that has orth orthography, orthography or orthographic in the title. And that's a Nancy Mather test. Uh, PAL2 has some tasks on it. And then this one, 
which we like called Early Reading Assessment, or the ERA. It's published by ProEd. Um, I think it's only the 2 to 7 or 4 to 7, something like that, very short age range. But, uh, but that makes sense uh, for beginning level readers. It's called Early Reading Assessment, and it's a pretty good instrument for getting at that orthographic processing. On, um, not in the book or on the CD that comes with the book, but on the XBAS, and I'll show this to you later, on the XBAS we have a drop-down menu of orthographic processing measures. So you would be able to select from that drop-down menu a number of orthographic processing tests. Because orthographic processing seems to be a blend of GV and GS, visual processing and processing speed. And um, you, so many of the tests that are in that drop-down menu really are uh, GV and GS kinds of, kinds of tasks. OK, uh, the new test, or uh, a test on the WJ4, letter pattern matching. See, it measures GS, processing speed, or perceptual speed here, and orthographic processing. Um, that's where the examinee locates and circles the two identical letter patterns in a row of six patterns. That's a good example of an orthographic processing kind of task. Okay? We classify it as GS, perceptual speed, because that's what it comes closest to measuring or tapping in CHC theory. But um, it, uh, it really is kind of a, a measure of orthographic processing. And it's, it's similar to number pattern matching, which used to be called visual matching. So when you do letter pattern matching and number pattern matching, and you, you are able to, uh, to have a cluster or um, a factor here, it's an orthographic processing factor. So those are the kinds of tasks that, that you, you want to give if you suspect that a student has um, a reading problem. It, it's nothing new, tell you the truth. We've known it for a long time. We've been measuring it as GS and sometimes as GV. It's just that, I don't know, it's just circling back now out, uh, in the literature and it's something that, you know, is important. Yes, sir? That's one of, that's a very good measure as well. That, it's a slightly different, but that is consistent with orthographic processing. That's where you've got the, the there are up different um, rotations and you have to match them and all, yeah, that's a good task. It's a little abstract, you know, but it gets at, it gets at that orthographic processing, yeah. Somebody else? No? Okay. Um, now, this is, I, I can't explain this really well, and I'm, I'm just telling you that up front, and this is not in your handout. I added this as well. Um, auth have you heard the phrase orthographic mapping? No? Well, you will. Again, nothing new. Um, Dr. Erie, or Eri, I think how you say it, um, decades ago talked about orthographic mapping. This is like one of those constructs that was introduced didn't make it out in the literature too much, um, and now is really surfacing as really an explanation of base, uh, basic reading development and development of a sight vocabulary. And I'm just reading about it now, and, and it's a little difficult to understand, but and this is why I keep mentioning David's name, because he's reintroducing this, this term or this phrase, orthographic mapping, and <coughs> um, how it's related to reading. But, it's the process we use to store written words and to re remember them for the future. So basically, according to Erie and Kilpatrick, um, it's, it's orthographic mapping is the process by which we build our sight vocabulary. And it's not a visual memory, okay? It's not that we remember um, uh, through our, our visual sense, you know, what, what a word looks like. It's some kind of brain mechanism or mapping that goes on in our brains that's called orthographic mapping. Um, we have spoken pronunciations of words stored in our long-term memory. And in, we have in our memory a sort of orthographic or phonological abstract representation of each of the letters in a sequence and it is the sequence of letters that activates the word. 
So I'm taking this right out of uh, David's writing. <clears throat> um, and I still have to really dig into this and learn it um, better. But it makes a lot of sense. The more I read about it, the more it, it does make sense. Um, so <clears throat> he gives examples like kids who, have, who are good readers, or we who, in the room who are good readers, no matter how you see a word, this is, I'm trying to give you like a, a simple you know, example. But whether you see a word in uppercase, lowercase, combination of uppercase, lowercase, even better, when we have different fonts, you know, when you have like, what is it, how do you say, Calibri, Calibri, I don't even know how you say it, <laughs> right? Times New Roman, all those other kinds of things. If you've got like a word that's each letter's in a different font, but you can recognize it automatically, the reason you can recognize it automatically and you have no difficulty reading it is orthographic mapping. It's, it's kind of like, it probably has to do with, you know, certainly our brain development, but also the language system in which we are raised. So for, meant for English and for Spanish and Romance languages, they're all pretty much pretty similar, right? You know, I mean, for the most part, it's a sound symbol relationship, you know, alphabetic principle kind of um, um, languages. And there are certain sequences, we know, Certain letter sequences don't make sense and don't make words, right? They just don't. We know that. And there are others that definitely do. And I'll give you another example. When I was growing up, uh, I used to, uh, what was they called? They, they, they were word uh, games, and there were letters, right? Like maybe 100 letters, and they, there were words in there, and you had to find the words, right? Well, word searches, thank you. See, I have GLR problems. I can't remember what they're called. But, um, but that reminds me of sort of what, I th what orthographic mapping is. When you did those tasks, you knew there were certain combinations of letters that went together, like S and T, right? St, right? That C and H. They're just things that are embedded in our long-term memory. They're mapped in our brains, and they help us with our sight vocabulary. It's not a visual. Our visual, our memory system could never be able to memorize all of those, those words that we have in our sight vocabulary. They come from some other mechanism. And, and what David is talking about, again, going back to Linnea Erie, is this thing called orthographic mapping. And um, it just seems to be, I, I, it just makes a lot of sense to me. Oh, you mean like a co security code? No, no, oh. No, no. When you get a passage that somebody sends you and they say, if you can read this, then, you know, you're. Probably. <laughs> and the, 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 first, aren't the first and the last one are the same, but all the ones in the middle are jumbled up. Right. Yeah, I would say that's pretty. Yeah, I would say that that fits in, in here as well. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to explain. I can't do justice to it. Um, David, <clears throat> um, I'm, he's going to have his book coming out, but. He, um, he really can talk about it intelligently, but even he says it took him a long term time to really get it. But just, I'm just throwing this out there, and I put it in um, like last night because um, I think orthographic mapping is going to be the, you know, the new phrase um, for, for learning. It's not, it's not the, it's, it's when you go from a basic reading skill of like phonics to that sight vocabulary, how you, how you have your sight vocabulary. And um, so, um, so here's some more information on it. Orthographic memory is a memory for precise sequences of letters connected to, a spoken, to spoken pronunciations, whether that sequence is a whole word or a part of a word. The look of the letters is not important. It is the sequence that is remembered, not the visual form of the letters or the words, OK? And that's why when we see them in different fonts and different sizes, uppercase, lowercase, it's not the look, OK? It's the sequence that is remembered. And that's what he's referring to as orthographic memory, or the memory for specific letter sequences, which influences sight word development, which is the basis of reading fluency. So you're basically going from a phonics, phonological awareness of learning your basic words 
then you're going to, using orthographic memory through an orthographic mapping system, right? That leads to um, your sight word development or sight vocabulary, and that is the basis of reading fluency. So then, if you've got a good sight vocabulary, you're able to read fluently. When you're able to read fluently, um, you're not taxing your working memory uh, system, and you're probably able to do better on reading comprehension. So kids who have reading difficulties, broadly speaking, it's our task to figure out where in that, where in that sequence of learning how to read is the system breaking down. Is it breaking down at the, the phonics level, that sound symbol um, uh, relationship level? Is it breaking down here through orthographic mapping, right? Which phonological awareness training can assist with? Um, or is it, uh, is it you know, reading fluency? Okay, um, or is it reading comprehension? Yeah. Um, do you think the test of visual perceptual skills is good? I mean, it doesn't use letters; it uses more geometric designs. And is that? It's related, but I think what the the thinking right now is that you really have to go more towards um, towards letters and numbers and words. You know, so <clears throat> here, um, you know, let me see if I can go back to, yeah. Is this the there's a, yeah, this is the test. The, the test of silent word reading fluency. Anybody know it? Yeah? So it's kind of cool. It, I, you can't see it from where you're sitting, but basically there's, there's words that are, you have several lines, right? And, and lots of words in each line. And what the student has to do, or you have to do, is draw, draw a line where the, where, uh, one word ends and the next word begins, right? And so, so it's not easy, but you've got, to, that's, you've got to have good orthographic processing in order to do that. You also have to have, a, you have, to have good sight um, reading, sight vocabulary, sight word reading. Uh, it's not a comprehension task, okay? But it's, it's, these, it's a series of words in a string, in a long string, and you have to draw, we call it the slasher. <laughs> You've got to draw, a, you have to put a slash in between um, every word, okay? So now if you don't have that, auth that sequencing and that orthographic mapping as a part of your system, it's going to be very difficult. Because then you're going to sit there and you're going to be trying to, you're going to look at every letter and you're going to have to sound out words. You're, not, you're going to bomb on that test. Students aren't going to be able to do well. So that's, that's a good test, um, the test of silent word uh, reading fluency. Um, it's, it's by ProEd again. It'll give you a, a little bit of insight into all the student's orthographic uh, processing and function. So I didn't want to spend <coughs> too much time on it. I just wanted to let you know that this is the, and it's not new, it's just that it's, it's resurfacing and a lot due to David Kilpatrick, and I really think that, um, He's onto something here because I think that that can explain a lot of uh, reading difficulties, and then hopefully we can have interventions that are based on it. Yeah. I was going to ask if there were any interventions based on this graphic mapping problem. Not that I know of yet, but I'm sure he does. You know, he knows it. But um, this is more of an assessment identification. But I think um, I think phonological awareness would help with that as well. Um, because you're doing the substitution, the deletion, and the, uh, those kinds of things. It, it's language-based, and I think you're getting, we're getting at it a little bit. You know, uh, that's what he'd probably, he would probably say. But there was another question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if David would say that's an orthographic problem. Um, it's a developmental problem, developmental issue or concern. Um, I'm not sure what he would say about it, but I mean, I guess it could be. Um, but you see that those make those make sense, like saw and was. I mean, because they're both they're both words, you know. Um, I'm not quite sure what what's going on there, but you know, the reversals and stuff, I mean, that has always been sort of a, I guess, a telltale sign of dyslexic or dyslexia, but dyslexia is much, you know, much more than 
as you know, it then led to reversals. Um, so we can ask David. <laughs> um, processing speed, uh, whoops. Processing speed, the speed at which visual stimuli can be compared for similarity or difference. So we do this, we've been doing this for quite some time. You know, uh, so symbol search is a great example of perceptual speed. Another one, rate of test taking. Coding is a rate of test taking uh, task. Number facility, which is the speed at which basic arithmetic operations are performed accurately. That's a, an important one um, for, for math, okay? So what is processing speed? It's basically fast thinking, okay? An individual's ability to perform simple clerical tasks quickly, especially when under pressure to maintain attention and concentration. Processing speed is important for um, all <clears throat> academic areas, reading, math, and writing, especially in the early elementary years. Um, it just is. And we also have uh, now reading speed and writing speed. They're under GRW, which is uh, reading and writing, but they're all, uh, also under GS. So you'll find them in, in a couple of different places. Um, but speed is important. How quickly, how automatic we do tasks is definitely important. Otherwise, the work becomes labored, burdensome, um, and draws on our working memory. And the more that we draw on our working memory, it's kind of like your gas tank. If you're burning up that gas, then you really don't have uh, enough to get you where you need to go. So GS is definitely important <clears throat> for all academic areas, reading, math, and writing. So when we take a look at GF through GS, um, and in this table, and this table is and throughout our writings, it's, it appears probably more than any other table that we, we uh, publish, but it's really a synopsis or a summary of the relations between CHC abilities and specific areas of academic achievement. So we try to just you know, give you a summary of, okay, GF, uh, is it important in reading, math, and writing, and if so, what are the narrow abilities that seem to be more important than others? Um, and we have those, um, you know, stated here. GC, see we were flip-flopping with GWM, GSM, we went back to GSM, it's, so in, um, in the XBAS it's GSM. GV, where we have orthographic processing, GA, GLR, and GS. This is just, again, a summary of what narrow abilities and broad abilities are important for reading, writing, and math, um, and developmentally what's important in the early elementary years, middle grades, and then also um, later on. And, you know, <clears throat> it is kind of true that the earlier we intervene, the better. So, I mean, I'm a big proponent of universal screening, uh, pre-K screening, K screening, being able to pick up on difficulties as early as possible. Because truth is, I believe, that you know, when we get into the middle grades and certainly into high school, if we have not addressed um, those learning problems, it's going to be much harder to address them then. Not impossible. I think that uh, there's, there's research out there that shows that we can teach um, middle, and school, or middle uh, school students and high school students how to read, but it's going to be a lot more difficult to, to do that at those grades. Oh yeah, it should be in there. Yeah, it should be in there. It should be everywhere. Um, I don't know what the book. <laughs> you know, the book came out in, what thirteen, and it's kind of like the concepts and principles are all good and up to speed, but we can we can keep up with the the test um, production out there. So that's why we had we're moving more towards online because we cannot keep up with it. So it's this that this chart is in there. Um, I'm not sure which chapter it is. This? Yeah. Sure. Well, this is in your handout. How did you get the handout? Did they email it to you? Oh, you want the single page. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I'll send it to Joanna or Jenny. We'll get it to you. Um, yeah, this is, this is something important to have, actually. Okay, so putting all the abilities together, um, basically, 
you know, as I've said, GC and GF are very important. So is GLR and GSM, and I'd probably throw in GS as well. Those are like, uh, you know, if I had to tell you which broad abilities are the most important, those are them. But it also depends on the age and the developmental level of the student we're talking about <clears throat> because it may vary um, based on, on age and development. So the top four most important abilities for learning and ap academic success are GFGC, GSM, and GLR. But those that are important for acquiring basic reading skills, GA, that phonological processing, and then that combination visual GV, GS, visual processing and processing speed known as orthographic processing. These are important for those basic reading skills. And then for o important for overall learning and academic success are the GLR, SM, GC, and GF. Without question, GF and GC are the really the two most important. I don't know if you notice on the WJ4, there's a GF, GC composite. Have you noticed that? Again, because highlighting the importance of GF and GC um, for overall academic success. If you, the WISC-4 had the, what's it called, the GAI, General Ability Index, what was it? It was, a, it was GC measures and GF measures. On the WISC-5, they have the GAI again, except they've added block design, I'm not sure why. My guess is it has a high G loading, but, um, but nevertheless, there's two other, two GCs and two GFs. GF, GC, GC, GF. You'd like take a look at any brief intelligence test, the KBIT2, Kaufman Brief Intelligence Test, GC test, and a GF test. All over the place, right? So um, if you can assess nothing else that says GF and GC, if GF and GC are intact, then there's good probability that even if the student has learning problems, that he or she can, can benefit from remediation, compensation, interventions. Poor GF and GC, those with intellectual disability, you've had the experience, you know that learning is very uh, labor, labor intensive and that there probably is a certain ceiling that those, those individuals can get to um, if they've got really poor GF and GC. Cross battery assessment. So <clears throat> let me just give you a very brief history of cross battery assessment. First of all, we've been working together for a long time now, uh, 20 years or so, on cross battery assessment. And however, before that, cross, crossing batteries was never, was not new. People have been crossing batteries for a long time. Neuropsychologists were crossing batteries well before school psychologists and, um, in, and are still doing it. <clears throat> Neuropsychologists still do it, right? They give a subtest from this battery, a subtest from that battery. They're measuring constructs, which is important. Um, rather than measuring, you know, giving a specific test, but measuring certain constructs that are important to measure. So neuropsychologists were doing it for a long time. Um, Dr. Flanagan, myself, Dr. Ortiz, and others, you know, we've basically kind of made cross-battery assessment a, like a, a package, or we've, we've added theory, psychometric rigor, and, um, and now moving towards uh, interventions. Uh, as part of the XBA uh, package, but it really isn't anything new. And if you think about it, <clears throat> if, if you were giving a whisk, and before, let's say before Wyatt ever came on the scene, right, the Wexler Individual Achievement Test, well, you were probably giving some other achievement test, or somebody was giving an achievement test, probably a WJ, right, maybe a KT or something like that. If you were giving a, a WISC and a KT, a WISC and a WJ, you're crossing batteries, okay? We've always been crossing batteries. So it's really nothing new. Um, people criticize cross-battery for a variety of reasons. Some of them are legit and some of them aren't because we've, we've basically been crossing batteries for, for ever since we've been testing. And because when you use two different batteries, you are using two different norm groups. They're, they're different constructs, et cetera. Um, but what we've tried to do is make cross-battery assessment two things as far as I'm concerned. It's a way of thinking about a case because it is uh, based on CHC theory and based on the reason for referral. So 
<clears throat> it really helps you think about what you should be measuring and how you should be measuring those constructs. And it's a method of how to do it. How do you take tests from different batteries? How do you combine them that's in a way that's psychometrically sound? Um, and how, do you, how can you draw valid inferences from those, um, those cross-battery composites, et cetera? Okay? So that's really what it is. We've been working on it for over 20 years. It's been our, our life work. And um, it's now at the point where we're moving towards web-based. The XBAS is not web-based. It's basically an updated, it's updated versions of the programs that are on the CD. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit more than that, but basically um, it's pretty similar. And then the next iteration, God knows when, um, will be web-based. So what we anticipate down the road is that you'll be able to go onto a, a, a website and, um, you know, with a username and password and just be able to do your work um, on a website uh, uh, so it'll be so that we can update the information much more quickly because there's no way we can keep up with uh, the proliferation of tests and so on. So the XBAS, <clears throat> um, we added 24 more batteries and over 200 additional subtests. So all told in cross-battery assessment, we have over a thousand subtests as part of our database, and well over a hundred, uh, over a hundred and a quarter uh, batteries that are a part of the database. So it's probably one of the largest test databases that you'll find out there, um, other than the Burroughs Mental Measurements uh, yearbooks. So um, that's kind of cross battery in a nutshell, in terms of the history and, and where we were and where we, we used to we used to have these uh, ec these worksheets that you did by hand. You know, you had, to, they were, you had to print them out and you used pen or pencil and you had to do the addition and all this kind of stuff. Now it's all automatized in Excel and then we'll move to that web base. But um, there's also been lots of changes that I'll take you through uh, as well. So anyway, cross-battery assessment um, is, um, helps us with all of these things and it's based on CHC theory uh, and since, since the beginning. So the guiding principles the core of, of XBA include um, selecting a battery that best addresses the referral concerns. All right. So today I would say a WISP, a WISP 5 or a WJ4, KBC2, DAS2. If you started with any of those batteries, you're in good shape. But certain batteries are better for um, certain reasons for referral. And so you may want to pick one battery over another as you're starting your core battery. Um, use clusters based on actual norms when they are available. So, you know, today you've got <clears throat> lots of options and lots of composites that you can use. So, if you need uh, measures of GA and it's not on your core battery, then go get it from the WJ4 and you'll use that composite, use the GA composite. That'll give you actual norms, right? As opposed to um, doing some kind of combination. <clears throat> Select tests classified through an acceptable method. Well, basically, we, um, we've classified those thousand subtests um, through a variety of procedures and uh, through fact, we haven't done the fact analysis, <coughs> excuse me, but we have incorporated the results of factor analyses in our writing and in our classifications. We've also done expert consensus and content analysis of these batteries and subtests. Um, so uh, that you need to, to know that they're pretty, um, pretty reliable and valid. OK, <clears throat> when broad abilities are underrepresented, go out of the battery. So for us, um, a broad ability composite consists of two or more qualitatively different narrow ability indicators, right? So let's say you want a GC broad ability composite. If you had a measure of lexical knowledge, VL, and general information, K0, you've got two different narrow abilities. That would constitute a broad ability, a CHC broad ability composite, OK? Two different narrow abilities under the same broad ability, OK? Or, <clears throat> um, so that would be, that's, that's what we mean by a broad ability composite. It can either come from the battery itself, or you can do it via crossing batteries. 
So let's take an example here. Um, this is the KVC tab of the XBA DEMIA. Okay. So the uh, sequential GSM scale, standard score is 97. You got two subtests, scale scores of 9 and 10. This is an estimate of memory span only because number recall and word order are measures of memory span or MS. There's no, really no working memory involved. So what you have here, we would call this a narrow ability composite because they're both measures of memory span. Same narrow ability. But if you wanted a broad ability representation, <clears throat> you want to give um, uh, an additional, uh, additional short-term memory measure, but you want it to be working memory because you want to get at that broad ability composite. So you could go to the um, CHC analyzer, as it's called in the, in the book and on the CD, and from the drop-down menu, obtain DAS2 recall of sequential order. You give that subtest, which is a measure of working memory right here, and the student earns a 102. So what the program does, the data management interpretive assistant, what the program will do is take these three subtests, um, because they're close, they're close scores, 9, 10, and a 102 is probably around a 10 anyway, 10, 11 scale score. Um, it adds them up and it gives you um, a 99. This is a broad ability composite because you've got memory span and working memory, two different measures of GSM, right? They're two different narrow abilities. It gives you a broad ability composite. If, you're, if broad ability composite is important to you and you need it. Um, we still say that broad ability composites are important. However, narrow ability composites are also be, are becoming really, um, I guess, what's really important. As we learn more and more about what narrow abilities are important, whether it's phonetic coding, <coughs> memory span, lexical knowledge, <clears throat> we may want to do more narrow ability assessment than broad ability assessment. Nevertheless, guiding principle for, C, uh, for cross battery is still um, you want good representation of abilities, especially those that are important for the reason for referral. Okay, um, oh sorry, but going back to this, this, so this is just an example of how you would use the CHC analyzer that's on, in the book and in the CD, on the CD, if, um, if your core battery scale measures two of the same um, narrow abilities and you want a broad ability assessment, you can go to a drop down menu and find different measures of working memory and then put it into the program and the program will tell you whether they go together or not. And I'll tell you more about that in a little while. <clears throat> so when you're crossing batteries, um, use tests developed in norm within a few years of another. In the book, we included tests um, that were published in 2001 through about 2012, okay? And then we, the book was in production and new tests were coming out. And so the book was sort of outdated in that respect because we didn't have the new tests in there. So, but um, because norms, just like um, lots of things in life, norms become old and stale, and they're just not representative of the current population or the way things are going. So we try not to include um, tests that are more than 10 years old. But as a clinician, um, I, there have been times when, when, I was, when, when I was working in schools, there were times when I used an old version of an instrument or a test that had been out of print because clinically it gave me the information that I needed and I still believe in that because I believe that our goal is to help the student so we do whatever we can. It's just that on a regular basis we shouldn't be using um, old instruments or previous versions. Um, you want to select tests from the smallest number of batteries. Typically you can do cross battery assessment with two batteries these days because again with something like the WJ4, the WISC-5, they're covering four, five, six broad abilities. So if you're going to need to cross batteries, you probably only need one other battery. Um, but if you, if you need to go to a third, so be it. But I think you can probably get by with two. And then you want to establish ecological validity for the test findings. Um, manifestation of weaknesses or deficits <coughs> in, oh, is it in that book? I think these are in the book. 
Um, if they're not in that book, they're in another book, um, planning, uh, planning, selecting, planning, selecting, and tailoring interventions for unique learners, which is um, a third book that we came out with, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago. Um, and it has a table like this for all of the broad abilities. It has the broad ability, the definition of that broad ability, the general manifestations of cognitive neuropsychological weaknesses, specific manifestations of that weakness in reading, math, and writing, and then some recommendations and interventions that address the weakness in that particular area. Um, and uh, this is also, in, oh, it's also in our Essentials of Specific Learning Disability Identification, but it's also in that new book, the planning book. So just like the Star Wars trilogy, we, um, we've got specific learning disability identification, cross-battery assessment, and then the intervention book. I'm not trying to sell, make you spend more money or anything. I'm just telling you that those three go together. And um, uh, I think you'd get all the information that you need from them. But these tables, I think, are pretty useful because they really help with designing interventions based on the CAC theory and ability, broad and narrow abilities. So how do you do step by, uh, how do you do cross battery step by step? Okay, so step one, you're going to select a battery that's considered most relevant in the light of referral concern. So what do you want to consider? You want to consider the age and developmental level of the student, the English language proficiency, and the specific referral concerns. I think, for, generally speaking, if you're concerned about a student having a specific learning disability, WISC-5, WJ-4, I think either one is perfectly fine, and you'll get a lot of information that you need from either battery. I still think you'll have to do some supplementing for either one of those. Some people like the KBC-2. I know out here in California, and with a lot of uh, a high Hispanic population, um, the um, seems to be a little bit more culturally sensitive, language sensitive, the KBC2. Uh, I'm not sure it, it, it definitely is or isn't, but certainly, um, uh, you know, there's the, the fluid crystallized index and then there's the mental processing index. Okay, so GC is not included in the mental processing. GC is clearly culture and language loaded, so that might be a good instrument. There's a, there's a test, the Stanford Binet 5, anybody use it? No, right? <laughs> it, you know what? It really is a great test f for certain, certain kids. And it's good for um, intellectual disability and gifted. There's 10 subtests on the Stanford Binet 5. Every subtest has a high loading on G. It's all GF and GC, basically, and, and um, RQ, quantitative reasoning. So it's a high G saturated instrument. So if you were working with those populations, gifted or intellectually disabled, um, it's a good instrument. i just give you that as an example of a battery that um, would answer specific um, re referral concerns. So you, you want to keep these things in mind, but because of uh, financial constraints and, and learning constraints uh, on terms of time, um, you might only have one or two batteries in your district or your school, so you'll have to use those. But you should be aware that there are other instruments and that it's really not about the instrument, it's about the constructs that you need to measure. That's the important piece. Okay, <clears throat> so implementation of course battery step two. You want to identify the CHC broad abilities that are measured by the cognitive battery. So um, if, if the broad ability consists of two qualitatively different indicators, two different narrow abilities, then it's adequate representation. If there's only one narrow aspect of the broad ability included, it's underrepresented. So an example would be actually the new WISC-5, right? The VCI is now similarities in vocabulary, right, I think? Yeah, well that's just lexical knowledge, so that's the same narrow ability. You don't have the broad ability represented on the VCI anymore. You did on the um, WISC-4, right, because it was vocabulary, similarities, and comprehension. comprehension, which is a measure of general information. So you did have a broad ability. The VCI was a GC broad, akin to a GC broad ability. The new VCI is now just lexical knowledge, so it's really a narrow ability uh, composite. Nothing wrong with it, I'm just telling you that it's not a broad ability, doesn't represent a broad ability uh, anymore. 
So if you only have one narrow ability, it's underrepresented, and then um, it might not be measured at all. Now again, this table here is a little outdated because it, it's in the book, but we don't have the WISC-5, the WJ-4, the KT-3. But this table basically, um, <clears throat> the usefulness of this table is that it tells you which batteries have either adequate <coughs> representation of the broad ability with a check mark, underrepresented broad ability, indicated with a U, and then a dash means it's not measured at all, okay? So um, it just gives you an idea of, of, of our batteries and what they're measuring at the broad ability level. So what I did was I took some of those slides. These are actually in the back of the handout. I moved, uh, moved them to the front because I wanted to show you the new, the WJ4 and uh, also the WISC-5 and uh, what they basically are measuring and not measuring, okay? So the WJ-4 has the GIA at the top and then here are the broad abilities, if you will, GC, GF, of course, GWM, because that's what they call it. We would call it GSM. GLR, GA, GV, and GS. So you've got pretty good representation of the broad abilities, right? But uh, GC has two different narrow abilities. GF has two different narrow abilities. GWM, however, each subtest, or test as they call it, uh, is a measure of working memory. So this is a narrow ability composite. GF and GC are broad ability composites. GLR has a measure of uh, meaningful memory and associative memory, so that's a broad ability representation. GA has a measure of PC and what they call UM or UM. Uh, I think it's memory for, memory for sounds. Um, not convinced that, that the subtest measures UM. I think it's a memory test and should fall under uh, over here, but in any case, um, this is broad ability because it's two different narrow abilities under the broad ability. Same with GV, two different, but GS, both measures are P, perceptual speed, so you've got um, a narrow ability composite there, okay? Um, here are some other clusters on the WJ4. Um, they have actually the pre-designed narrow ability composites. Um, there's a GF narrow ability composite, it's an RQ. There's a GWM, as I said, um, uh, with MS as the narrow ability, each subtest measuring that. GS, they have an N number facility um, clinical cluster. <coughs> they have a GSP clinical cluster, and then a GC. Um, VLLD clinical cluster. So these are narrow ability um, clusters, clinical clusters. And this is um, CE is cognitive efficiency, I believe. And there's um, a, a standard and an extended cognitive efficiency uh, clusters, okay? So I'm just trying to point out to you the structure of the WJ. There clearly are several broad abilities that have two different measure, two different narrow abilities under them. There are others that are the same narrow, the same narrow ability, okay? Because you've got to know what the tests are measuring in order to do your cross-battery assessment. And then there are some extended factors on the WJ. Oops, sorry. Um, there's a GC that has three subtests, a GF that has three subtests, and a GWM that has three subtests. It's interesting though, the GC has a K0, that's a general information subtest, and then two VL subtests. This is probably the best example of a broad-based or a broad ability assessment of GF. There's a measure of I, a measure of RG, and a measure of RQ. Three different narrow abilities, same broad ability. The question becomes, or <clears throat> is becoming over time, which narrow abilities are the most important to measure? So, you know, are all three of these important to measure? Well, it really depends on the reason for referral. But, uh, and then the GWM, all of three of these are measures of working memory. So do you need all three? 
Again, if, if working memory is um, a suspect, that it's a problem area, you might want to do the extended factor on the WJ. Depends. Um, this actually is, oh, so this is now the WISC-5. I should say that up there, sorry about that. But um, you've got one, two, three, four, five uh, broad abilities here, right? And a six down here is the GLR. Why it's not a primary index, I'm not sure. They call it a supplemental, but uh, it's there nevertheless. And then, you know, they finally broke out um, the PRI into GV and to GF, okay? Which they should have done, you know, a long time ago. You have the composition of the WISC-5 full-scale IQ. These are the seven tests that make up the full-scale IQ, we went from 10 to 7. And then these are the primary index scales. So your VCI, as I said, it's similarities of vocabulary. Those are both LD, I'm not LD, sorry, VL, lexical knowledge. So that's a narrow ability um, composite. The VSI, block design and visual puzzles, those are both measures of VZ. So that's a narrow ability uh, composite. Matrix reasoning and figure weights, um, this is GFI and this is RG, so that's two different narrow abilities, so you're covered here. The working memory index, it's probably digit span on the, on the WISC-5 is a lot more working memory than it is memory span. <clears throat> and then picture span is memory span, so you probably have a good um, broad ability here. And then the PSI, processing speed index, coding is R9. Symbol search is P, so this is another broad ability um, cluster as well, right? So this is basically what I just said. GC and GV, um, these are broad ability clusters or composites. Um, no, sorry, these are, yeah, these are. Um, if uh, VL and K, K, you're missing K0, that's what I'm trying to say, and here they're both VZ, so these are really narrow ability composites and these are broad ability composites. And then to wrap up here, these are some ancillary indexes and complementary indexes. You have the QRI or the quantitative reasoning index, auditory working memory index, nonverbal, um, general ability and cognitive processing uh, index. And then here are those complementary indexes. Symbol translation, this is the GLR, this is all MA associative memory. And then your naming speed, naming speed literacy, that's a measure of NA, according to GLR, GLR NA. Naming speed quantity is a measure of N under processing speed. Um, so there's a little uh, mixing going on here, but in any case, a pretty good, um, pretty good test. So there's your WJ4 and your WISC-5 in terms of does it have broad ability representation or narrow ability representation. Still a need for cross-battery assessment as far as we're concerned. <clears throat> okay, if your broad ability is underrepresented or not measured, let's just stick with the WISC-5. It doesn't measure GA. You need to measure GA. So you look out of the battery to supplement the core battery if necessary in light of the referral. So if you gave the WISC-5, you need a GA. I would give the WJ-4 if you have that in your, um, in, in, in your toolkit and you'll give the whole composite, the whole GA composite or factor, because um, you want to use actual norms, and you're probably going to get a pretty good assessment of GA if you use the WJ4, okay? Um, you want to identify the narrow abilities and processes that are measured by the selected cognitive ability, right? So let's say, I mean, there are batteries where there's a narrow ability that's measured that really has nothing to do with anything, right? It's just not useful information. So you might have to go out of your core battery to a supplemental battery or another, another test to find measures of that narrow ability that are important. So in the book, this is a piece of or part of Appendix B. And Appendix B is um, on the CD. It's also in the book in full. And we, uh, we laugh about this appendix and joke about it a lot because 
It basically is our database of all subtests that are included in cross-battery assessment. So the one that's in the book right now has about 800 subtests um, from about 100 batteries. And then the XBAS, the, the new um, software that we have, that has the additional um, subtests and batteries. But this is where you'd go to Appendix B, and if you need a measure of, let's say you need a measure of general sequential reasoning or deductive reasoning because your battery doesn't have that, then you would go to Appendix B, go to Fluid Intelligence, or GF, find deductive reasoning or general sequential reasoning, here are the subtests from different batteries that measure RG. This is the age range in years for which that subtest is applicable. So you could go, I don't know, maybe some of you know the C-Tony 2, right? So you might want to go to the C-Tony 2 for the geometric sequences um, subtest or the pictorial sequences subtest. Um, I don't know, some of you might use the RIAS, the Reynolds Intellectual Assessment Scales. Um, there's a subtest there called odd item out that we believe measures RG, so you could use that. The point is that Appendix B is your database. It's your bank of subtests that if you need to measure any narrowability that um, our tests measure, you can go to Appendix B and find the test. Yeah, it's on the XBAS. It's, um, it's, a, it's a separate tab and you go to the tab, and it's all, it's basically Appendix B with the new test, and um, it also has that orthographic processing and executive functioning, speed of lexical access, and some others, and some other nuances, but basically it, um, it's the same setup, and you can follow it pretty easily. So, okay, step four, you administer and score the battery and supplemental tests. Um, you know, none of our work is a scoring program. You have to score the tests yourself and then put the scores into our software. We don't have the norms for any of these batteries. Um, if we did, um, I'd be in jail, so you wouldn't be talking to me right now. Um, we don't have access to that, and we don't want access to that. Uh, so you have to score it yourself. But um, And then you enter the scores into the Data Management Interpretive Assistant, the, or the DEMIA. Okay. <clears throat> we'll get to that momentarily. So what's new to cross-battery assessment? First, um, we use expanded CHC theory, okay? So um, at least in the book, in the CD, you're going to see those neuropsych um, uh, broad abilities, okay? And you're going to see, um, basically, we've um, classified our tests according to the um, expansion of CAC theory. Now, this is kind of outdated, but um, in, in terms of the book, because we don't, uh, at the time that we were preparing the book, the WISC-4, um, WISC the WIPSI-4 was brand new. We were able to get that in there. Um, we include uh, neuropsych instruments like the DCAPs, the NEPSI-2, and then some, you know, a lot of special purpose tests. At the time we were preparing the book, it was pretty up to date, <clears throat> but then a year later, um, a lot of, and, and, and even now, there's, there's even tests that, we, that just came out that didn't make the, um, didn't make the XBAS. There's a math fluency test that's coming out by ProEd, um, and, um, and another test um, by um, PAR that's coming out. Um, Pfeiffer assessment of reading. I, strongly suggest you take a look at that instrument when it comes out. Steve Pfeiffer, pretty big leader in, um, in reading disability and reading assessment, and it's going to be a test published by um, PAR, and the acronym for his test is FAR. So FAR, published by PAR, will give you, um, you know, tell you what, <laughs> what that test is, Pfeiffer assessment of reading. So that's not in here. It'll be in another iteration. Like I said, Appendix B, whoops, sorry. Appendix B is in the book or on the CD or on the DEMIA. This is kind of our table of elements. This is our like go-to um, when we want to know what tests are measuring and, and what battery and what the age range is. This, <clears throat> this is called the CHC Broad and Narrowability Analyzer. So when you're crossing batteries, 
this is the tab or the analyzer you want to go to. Uh, and then the program will let you know if you've got a cohesive composite or not. And um, it consists of these drop down menus. And these are on the X baths as well. These drop down menus. So basically, you, you would click, see this little uh, triangle here. You'd click on that, and the drop down menu appears. And then whatever test you gave, you know, was it a C Tony, a decaps, I don't know, was it uh, something, was it a K bit, whatever, it'll populate into the cell. You put in the score, and then it will take that score in addition to the other scores that are already there that you've brought over from a test tab and then combine them if and only if it makes sense to do so. And I'll tell you um, how the program decides that. But um, that's, this is the CHC analyzer. Okay. So why didn't the CTOP, uh, why didn't the CTOP in, cross, in the cross battery book? Basically it was outdated at the time that we prepared the book, okay? Because the norms uh, were gathered before 2001. At the time, the CTOP 2 wasn't released, so we didn't put it in the book, but it's now in XBAS. So um, if, you, if you obtain that, you'll see it there, okay? But basically, we try to practice what we preach. We don't like to use old tests. If there's a newer version that's out, we prefer to, to, um, to use that and for folks to use it. Um, I've said this already, there's about 800 tests and subtests in the book. In the XBAS, we've topped 1,000 uh, subtests and over 125 um, batteries. What's in the book is we've classified all our tests according to neuropsych, not all of them, all of our cognitive and neuropsych batteries according to neuropsychological domain. So you probably all know school neuropsych is one of the hottest things in school psychology. Um, there's just been a proliferation of books on school neuropsychology. And so what we did was we took, I think we have nine neuropsych domains. And this comes, these domains come from Miller, Hale and Fiorello, um, some major neuropsych textbooks, and so on. And what we did was simply classify um, each of our cognitive batteries and neuropsych batteries each, we've classified each of the subtests, this is a KBC2, according to the neuropsych domains. So if, if you're giving the KBC2 or really any cognitive battery, you want to know what it measures, the subtests measure according to um, neuropsych theory, you can go to this. It's an appendix in the book. It's on the CD. You can print it out and use it if you like. So that's in the book. Um, People have questioned us on terms of our uh, inter-rater reliability on the classifications. So we did a little study within the book uh, <clears throat> for um, the tests that were added from cross battery two to cross battery three. And so we had two dyads, uh, myself and Dr. Flanagan and Drs. Ortiz and Dinda. We independently classified all the tests according to CHC theory. And then we did inter-rated reliability analyses. And this is just a, a snapshot of that study that we did. When you talk about broad ability domains, you know, our classifications are uh, the inter-rated reliability uh, according to three different methods is 0 0.96, 0 0.95, 0 0.95. Broad ability level, almost everyone in the room is, you give a, if I told you a, a test was um, vocabulary words, you're going to say it's, it's lexical knowledge, right? It's just, I mean, you're going to say it's GC, sorry. It's going to be a broad ability GC. Um, and you'll probably say that it's lexical knowledge. But there are many subtests out there that we know what a broad ability it's measuring, but the narrow ability is a little bit unclear. And that's what you see in this, in this table. When you see low inter-rated reliabilities like 0 0.76, 0 0.67, it's because the tasks on those subtests, you know, probably involve more than one narrow ability, and so there was disagreement. So, at the narrow ability level, little uh, disagreement. At the broad ability, almost everybody will say it's the same broad ability. But that's a little study we did. Um, another, oops, another thing that we did, we took all uh, achievement subtests from achievement batteries, 
and we broke them, broke them down into <coughs> the eight areas of IDEA, right? Basic reading, reading fluency, reading comprehension, written expression, math problem solving, math calculation, listening comprehension, oral expression, the eight areas. We took all the achievement batteries and the subtests and we said, all right, let's lay them out in a table and let's give you some qualitative information regarding the task demands and task characteristics. So, uh, does the subtest, does the reading comprehension subtest of the KTEA, is it open-ended questions, multiple choice, literal questions, inferential questions? Is it silent reading, oral reading? Does the examiner read? Does the examinee read? Is there a time limit? Basically, ad nauseum, whatever characteristic we think that the test involves, qualitatively, we lay it out for you so that, I mean, not that you have the time to, to check on all these things, but if you only have KT, you know, two or three in your school, then you can easily go to these tables and see what's involved in the subtest, you know? Because we firmly believe, especially with kids with learning problems, how you ask the question may actually be very important information in terms of helping that particular student. Because kids with learning problems don't learn the same way as the typical um, developing student. So qualitative analysis is important. So we, we put all of this into the book as well. Um, and then, you know, now you'll really think we're crazy and obsessive compulsive, but for the cognitive and neuropsych tasks, tests, we did <clears throat> basically the same thing. So this is an example of GLR associative memory. These are subtests that measure GLR associative memory. You have KBC, NEPC, um, test of memory and learning, WJ. Wexler memory scale, and so the, the subtests, and then these are the test characteristic or demand of those subtests. So we take, for example, what's this one? WJ, visual auditory learning. It involves an examiner spoken auditory stimulus. Uh, it's a brief verbal stimulus. Uh, the instructions um, are via demonstration or modeling. Um, gesturing and pantomiming required, item feedback when correct. This goes on forever. It's basically the characteristics of cognitive and neuropsych subtests um, that are involved in successful performance. So you have that in the book. I think there's more appendices in the book than there are pages in the book, you know, in the actual text. It's, there's like M or N appendices in the book. They're all on the CD. You can print out whatever you want. Okay, um, another thing that we've been um, criticized about is how we, went, how we went about creating composites. So you took a subtest from this battery and a subtest from that battery. Well, for the longest time we were averaging. We were just basically adding them up. If you had a scaled score of nine on one subtest and a scaled score of five on another, we added them up, you got 14, you divide by two and you got seven. Right? That was the, then that became the composite, um, the, uh, composite score. Well, we were criticized for that, and in some respect, we understand, and it's true, um, but only for a certain range of the normal curve or in a distribution of scores, because when you average two scores, the closer they are to the mean, the closer that the, um, the average of those two scores will be to a, a published norm or to a, a formula, a uh, result of a formula that's used for those two scores, okay? When you get to the extremes of a distribution, then the average doesn't really capture the norms or the, the formula. I'll show you what I mean in a moment. But, so what we've done in, in the book and now in the XBAS is Scores are, when you're doing cross battery, the scores are combined using a formula, okay? So um, the, the, and the formula will only combine scores when they're close enough um, to each other, okay? So we don't average anymore. <coughs> Averaging doesn't um, exist 
we, um, we use a formula to combine scores that will, that's very similar to what test publishers do when they publish their instruments. They're ba surely based on the, the norms, but, um, but they also use some formula when they smooth the norms, okay? So in, our, in the book and now in XBAS, there's over 2,500 correlation coefficients from all of these different batteries that were used in order to create um, uh, the formula uses in order to create composites, okay? This is a, a good example of what I mean when you use three different ways to calculate a cross-battery composite. The yellow line is the XBA mean. That's just an arithmetic average. And as you can see, when you're in this area here, okay, the yellow line overlaps with the green line, which is a formula that calculates a composite. And then the WISC-4 norms is the purple line. You can see the purple and the green overlap almost identically. And then the averaging, which is the yellow, starts to separate when you get um, to the lower part of the distribution and the higher end of the distribution. These are standard scores, okay? But basically in the middle. So, you know, if you ever want to know, like, you know, even from the same battery, if you've got a scaled score of uh, 8 and a scaled score of 10, right, that's 18, you divide by 2, that's 9, I can almost guarantee you that the norm is going to be 9 as well, right, because they're closer to the mean. So you can always just do an arithmetic average and come very close to what the published norm is going to be. Test publishers don't want you to know that, right? Um, but this is just an example of how close they really are in reality. And that, in fact, we think that an arithmetic average is actually a better index. Let's say you've got a low-functioning individual. He or she earns, you know, um, you know a, a 60 and a 70 on two, two subtests with a mean of, uh, mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. Right? 60, what did I say? 60 and 70, right? So that's 130. 130 divided by 2 is a 65. We believe the 65 comes closer to reality than the published norm. What will the published norm be? 58. Exactly. Or 56. It can, the, lower the, the lower the two scores are, the two individual scores are, the composite will be lower than either of the contributing scores. If you've got a 120 and a 130, the arithmetic average is 125. The published norm for the composite will be about 135, 137, because of, again, the way that the formulas that are used and a whole thing called, um, what the heck is it called? Condi um, it's con conditional probability, OK? Uh, it has, has to do with the way that where scores fall on a continuum and the probability of, of what somebody will earn given his or her performance on the other subtest. It's a little, it's combinatorial probability, that's what it's called. You don't need to know that. I'm just telling you why you see on some batteries, well, actually on all of them, if you've got two low scores, two low subtest scores, the composite's going to be lower than either one. If you've got two high subtest scores, the composite's going to be higher than either one, okay? So we think when you average, it's actually closer to reality because that's kind of how the person performs. So anyway, we don't average anymore. So going back to this example where you've got the, remember we were doing the sequential scale from the KBC2 and it was the number recall and word order subtest, a 9 and a 10. Um, this 97 right here, that's the published norm. 97 comes from the KBC2 manual. What I'm trying to show you, when, if you transferred number recall and word order to the CHC analyzer, which is right here, okay? If you transferred these two over to here and said, okay, tell me what the composite is, it's a 97. The 97 matches, the 97 that it comes from the formula that we have embedded in the program matches the norm of 97 because we've moved to these formulas that are based on reliability coefficients and intercorrelations among um, the subtests that are found on our major batteries, okay? So it comes pretty close. 
Uh, we've updated the relations between uh, or among cognitive abilities, neuropsych processes, and academic skills. Okay, and um, so that's that's what's all new to cross-battery assessment. Now the DEMIA data management interpretive assistant was re revised extensively. Okay, so we have more test tabs um, than on the XBA in the XBA two book. We have a CHC tab that calculates clusters based on median subtest reliabilities and internal correlations. We don't average anymore. We have drop down menus, interpretive statements, and so on and so forth. So I don't know if anybody used Cross Battery 2. I can't even remember what Cross Battery 2 looked like because it wasn't that long ago, but um, Cross Battery 3 is very different than Cross Battery 2, and XBAS is moderately different from Cross Battery 2. Uh, and I'll show you uh, in what ways. Okay, so if you insert the CD from the book, from the back of the book, you accept the license <coughs> agreement, you choose programs, contents, programs, and then you want the data management and interpretive assistant, okay? There are three programs on the disk. One is the DEMIA, I'm gonna show you that now. Second one is Pattern Strengths and Weaknesses Analyzer. I'll show you that today as well, hopefully. And then the Cultural Language Interpretive Matrix. That's the CLIM. If you've heard Dr. Ortiz before or seen him before, he's the primary uh, author on the CLIM. And that's the Cultural Language Interpretive Matrix to help you with the assessment of um, English learners or English language learners. OK, so when you open up the XBA Demir, this is what you'll see. Um, this is the pretty much the opening page. Whoops. Um, the programs are meant to be used on a PC, not a Mac, but for those of you who use a Mac, um, if you call Wiley, they'll give you the programs um, in Mac uh, format, so you can, you can get them for free from, from the publisher. Um, you must enable macros for the programs to function properly. So what will happen is when you, you have to enable macros, it'll say some active content has been disabled. So you just um, say enable the content, it's right there. Enable content, hit OK, and then the program will um, work with no problem. Best to view the program at 100% magnification. We've got a notes tab, it's important to read the, the notes to give you some um, good information about the program and you're ready to kind of rock and roll. So orientation to the DEMIA 2.0. As I said, you've got instructions and notes. Look like this. All of this is on the tab itself. You just click, you open it, you can read it. You can print out what you want, but this just gives you um, notes on, on some of the test tabs and um, some graphs. Um, there's if you, on the WJ3, I know you're not using it anymore, but on the WJ3 there were clinical clusters. I don't know if you remember those. They were called, uh, it's cut off over here, but broad attention, cognitive fluency, executive processes. You know they dropped them all from the WJ4. You don't have any of those anymore. I don't know if you realize that. These were part of the WJ3. Um, so we included them on the DEMIA. And um, what you would do is, Whoops. If you did the WJ3 clinical clusters, you could transfer them to the neuropsych section of the CHC analyzer, um, like here, and it would um, put them uh, here and then analyze them for cohesion if, uh, if, you, if you gave those tests, okay? Um, because on, the WJ, on any scoring program, whether it's WJ4 or WISC-5, whatever you put in, if it contributes to the composite, it will give you a score, right? You could have, I'm giving you an example, but you could have similarity scaled score of 18 and a vocabulary score of six, it will still give you a, right? It'll still give you a VCI. <clears throat> it doesn't matter where the scores are, it's still gonna combine them no matter what. We don't do that. We say scores need to be close enough to each other in order to have a cohesive composite, right? So if you want to think of old terminology, subtest scatter, or you know, whatever phrase you want to use, the point is that we don't believe you should add or have a composite that's made up of a scaled score of 18 and, and a scaled score of 6. It just doesn't make any sense. 
they're, they're just completely different, statistically and clinically different from each other, okay? But, so that's why, if you, whatever you transfer over to the CHC analyzer, it will only give you composites that make sense according to the, the, um, the absolute value of the scores that the person earned. It won't, it won't add up two, three, or four scores add up. It will not give you a composite for two, three, or four scores unless those two, three, or four scores are close enough according to certain rules to be combined. Okay? So I told you this already. We don't need to go over it. It's again, it's Appendix B. Why was the C top left out? We know why. Oh, we include tests that have age-based norms only. The PAL-2, which is a great test, has grade-based norms only. And uh, cross-barrier assessment uses age-based norms. So we don't include the PAL-2. It's, it's a shame because it's a great instrument, but um, grade norms and age norms probably should not be mixed, okay? Um, because you have, you have basically just they're, they're two different reference groups. Um, we have a test graph, oops, sorry, test graph index. Everything can be graphed. Um, this is the test graph index. Um, so it, it has a space for demographic information, the cognitive batteries, the achievement batteries, the CHC analysis, some uh, graphs, okay, and some other tabs. You can also save the data or save the file as, so you can save all your work for each, um, each person. On the XBAS, you can do up to 500 cases um, stored right in the file itself. And then, so it now has an internal database. So Jane Doe, Sally Smith, you know, whoever. Um, you just, if you, you click on that person, it'll call up that data again for that person. So it's kind of cool. Can't do that on here. You have to save the file as a separate file. In the XBAS, however, it's all built in. You just click on the record and that person will show up. So, um, okay. So, <clears throat> we go to the WISC-5. This is what the WISC-5 will look like on your disk, okay, in Cross Battery 3. Uh, this is WISC-4, sorry. WISC-4, on the XBAS, it'll be the WISC-5. Um, it'll look pretty similar, but what we do here is we, we evaluate the composite or the index um, according to cohesion and follow-up recommendations, okay? So what we mean by cohesion is basically are the two scores or the three scores that make up that index, are they similar enough? Are they statistically significantly different from each other? Um, and we, when it's a two subtest um, composite or two subtest index, we have two different ways of looking at cohesion. Are the two scores significantly different from each other? Is a nine, or a nine and a five significantly different from each other? That's one question. Second is, is that difference uncommon? So if you have a nine and a five, that's a four point difference. Well, how often in the standardization sample was there a four point difference between those two subtests? So if it's greater than 10% of the time, then it's common or frequent. If it's 10% if it's or less of the time, like let's say a nine, difference between a nine and a five occurred you know, in only 7% of the population, then the program will say that that's infrequent or uncommon. So it's statistically significant and it occurs infrequently, therefore it's something you should pay attention to because most people do not have a difference of that magnitude. So that's what the program will do um, for two subtest composites. For three subtest composites, like the VCI on the WISC-4, it will look at infrequency or uncommonness only because you can't do statistical significance when you have more than two subtests. So what it will do is the program will say similarities, vocabulary, and comprehension, those three subtests, what's the difference between the highest scale score and the lowest scale score? And if that difference between highest and lowest is less than 10%, the program will tell you do not use a composite score because it's not a cohesive composite or index because there's too much spread 
in the three scores. Okay? So that's what we mean by cohesion. The program will also tell you whether you should follow up, do follow up assessment or not. Follow up assessment is basically mutually exclusive from cohesion because what follow up assessment suggests is it's based on our uh, rules of thumb whether you should follow up or not. So if a composite is cohesive or not, um, whether you follow up on a lower score is different from cohesion. So, and I'll explain this a little in a little uh, more depth as we go along, but follow-up recommendation is more like a clinician's, um, it's a clinician's way of, of following up, okay, rather than a statistical one, all right? I'll give you a better example um, when we get there. So for all composites entered into the DEMIA, the program answers these questions. Is the composite cohesive and is there a need for follow-up assessment? Okay? Basically what I just said. What do we mean by cohesion? Composite is cohesive it's considered to, if it's considered to be a good summary of the related abilities it's intended to represent. All right? So um, let's take the WJ3 fluid reasoning factor, analysis, synthesis, and concept formation. Um, that's a two subtest composite. So what we did was we, we looked at the standard deviation of the distribution of different scores um, to determine if two subtests were uh, cohesive or not. In English, is a 105 significantly different from an 87? Right? So the program tells you that. And it's based on a formula, the standard deviation of the distribution of difference, which takes into account the correlation between the two measures. Um, and, then, and then that base rate information, or whether that difference between the two subtests, is it occur in 10% or less of the population or more than 10%, okay? So when you're interpreting a two subtest composite on the test tabs, you're not doing any of this. The program does it all. The difference between scores is not significant or uncommon. Um, the program will tell you that the composite's cohesive. If it's statistically significant, the difference between the two scores is sig statistically significant, but you know what? It occurs in more than 10% of the population. The program says use your clinical judgment as to whether to interpret that composite as cohesive or not. However, if the difference between the two scores, like let's take that 18 and that 6, right, that's statistically significant and you know that, you know, maybe one in a thousand or five thousand people would have two scores like that um, from the same domain, uh, then we say that's not cohesive, do not interpret that composite. So you look at the WJ3, in this case, uh, in this example, comprehension knowledge, um, student earned a 101 uh, factor score, and then the two test scores, 97 and 105. This is an eight point difference here. So the program says that's cohesive. You can interpret the 101. That's a good composite. You can interpret that because, you know what? 97 and 105 are not statistically significantly uh, different from each other, and almost always when they're not statistically significant, it's not infrequent or uncommon, okay? This one, long-term retrieval, here's the overall score in 83. The two test scores were 97 and 65. That's a 32-point difference. Yeah, that's statistically significant and rare. It's very rare that a person would have a 32-point difference between these two subtests. So the program says that's not cohesive, okay? Do not interpret that 83 because it's not a good indicator of the person's performance on these two tests. And then this example, this is um, visual spatial thinking from the WJ3. 107 is the overall score and you got two test scores, 90 and 115. That's a 25 point difference. That's statistically significant, but you know what? Believe it or not, 25 points occurs in more than 10 percent, a 25 percent, 25 point difference occurs in more than 10 percent of the population. Therefore, it's not uncommon. Use your clinical judgment whether you should interpret the 107 or not. 
all based on the formula that's embedded in the program, and then there's a 44 page, which is provided for you in the appendix, in an appendix D, of all the, uh, the points that are necessary by age for each composite on each of the major test tabs, on the test tabs, um, if you wanted to see what the actual values are. Not that you want to do this, <clears throat> believe me. You don't. Because I'm the one who did this, and I, I was ready to blow my brains out um, pretty much by the end. Because, again, we, we've been criticized for so much of what we do, and I think there's this, that's the old saying of, you know, sort of imitation is flattery, but if the more you're criticized, it means the more that you're having an impact because you're stepping on other people's toes. So hopefully, it's a good thing that we're getting criticized. But because we were criticized so much, we provide a variety, no, we provide different values based on different methods of significant difference. And um, so the ones that are, the program uses are in these last two columns in this, um, in this appendix. So you want to know where we get the numbers from? So remember, the GC, this was a 97 and a 105. That's an eight-point difference, right? Well, you need 10 or more for statistical significance. That's the, um, and you would need 17 um, for um, infrequent or uncommon. But remember, if, it's, if this is a no statistical significance, right, they're not statistically different from each other, then this is almost always going to be a no, okay? If this is yes, this may be no or yes depending on the value, okay? Same thing here. We had a 32-point difference. You need 18 points for statistical significance, but, and you need 30 points between the two for um, base rate or uncommonness. And so you have 32, that's greater than 30, so that's why you have a yes here, yes and yes. And then finally, whoops, sorry, <clears throat> you have, uh, what did I say, 25 point difference here. You need 19 for statistical significance, so that's why the program says yes. <laughs> but you need a 32 point difference in order for this to say yes, it's only 25, so it says no. So when you have that combination, it says clinical judgment needed, right? So you don't need to know the table or anything, you just need to know why does the program say cohesive or not cohesive or clinical judgment. Three subtest composite, it's a little different. As I said, you can't um, do statistical significance, so it says not applicable. But you can do infrequency or uncommonness, right? <clears throat> and that comes usually from the test manuals. So in this case, you've got a, uh, the VCI from the WISC-4. You have a scale, scale scores of 9, 7, and 8. The program takes the difference between the highest value, 9, and the lowest value, 7. 9 minus 7 is 2. And then it evaluates that difference against um, a criterion. And so the program in this case says no, it's not infrequent or uncommon. That should, you know, not be a surprise. Here, however, on the PRI, you've got a 12, a 10, and a 5. 12 minus 5 is 7. That's a pretty big difference. The program says not cohesive. Where does it get it from? It gets it from the same appendix. For the VCI, you need five scale score point difference between highest and lowest. For this to say not cohesive, it's only two. So it says cohesive. You need six points for the PRI, and um, it's seven. So that's why the program says not cohesive. So that's what we mean by cohesion or cohesiveness. Follow-up recommendations, um, that's a whole different animal because, let me get to it. And again, this is all in the book, but you don't need to know it. These are our rules of thumb for when you should follow up or not. What, regardless of whether the two scores are significantly different from each other, the question is, do you need to follow up, right? So let's say you've got a scaled score of five on one subtest and a scaled score of two on another subtest. Should you follow up on the scaled score of two? The program will say yes because the maximum minus the minimum is greater than two, so yes, you should follow up. 
A scale score of 5 minus a scale score of 2 is 3. That's greater than 2, so you should follow up on the 2. You don't have to do it. We're just saying from a clinician's perspective, you know, even if the 5 and 2 were not significantly different from each other, you should follow up on the 2 because that's a pretty bad score. That's a pretty low score, you know. Um, if, however, the minimum, if you had a scale score of 5 and it's on one subtest and a scale score of 4 on the other, there's no need to follow up on the 4. But what if you had a 5 and a 3? Well, that's a two-point difference. Maybe you should follow up. It's, you know, you use your clinical judgment. So cohesion is based on statistical significance and clinical significance using formula and based on data. The follow-up is based on clinical acumen, clinical thinking, and what we did was we, we had the normal curve in front of us and we said, okay, where do the two scores fall? And depending on where they fall, the maximum minus the minimum, we said, yes, you should follow up, or no, it's not necessary to follow up. And then this is for three subtests. This is, this is crazy because you've got three subtests now, A, B, and C, so you've got to take into account A versus B, A versus C, and B versus C. You don't do any of this. I'm just, this is what's embedded in the program and uh, gives you the, the rationale behind the decisions that we made, okay? So here we have um, a case, Joe, Joseph, and uh, this is a WISC-4, his WISC-4 data, and the printout or what would happen if you put all the scores in. What's cohesive? What's clinical judgment? Um, do you need to follow up? Yes or no? Yes, no, no. Or sometimes it'll say maybe. And it's all based on the scores that you put in, and then the program does its analysis and prints out um, or gives you this information. Okay? Um, this is, uh, these are clinical clusters on the WISC 4. If you have the essentials of WISC 4 assessment, that, that's where these come from. Okay, does the same thing, cohesive, clinical judgment, no, maybe, um, it gives you the, um, all of that information, okay? So if you want, you can transfer um, um, scores, these subtest scores, whichever ones you want, you click off, the, click off the box and transfer it, whoops, sorry, there's a, down here it says transfer scores to the CHC analyzer. Um, you can transfer them over, and so whether or not you know the VCI consists of vocabulary, comprehension, and similarities, but if you want it to include information, you can click on information, transfer it with vocabulary and comprehension, and the program will tell you whether you can obtain a composite or not. And in this case, these three scores um, it converts all scaled scores to standard scores, so it converted the 9 to 95, and et cetera. These three are close enough together, um, so it added them up. No, it didn't add them up. Use the formula, and it yields a 92, okay? So, showing you an example of that. If uh, you want to include arithmetic with letter number sequencing and digit span, you can transfer them to the CHC analyzer. Um, in this case, this is important information because it, you added, uh, you put arithmetic in the cell um, and you want to know is it consistent with letter number sequencing and digit span and the program says no, it's not. Arithmetic and letter number sequencing can get together because the six and the seven are very close. Therefore, they yield a, scale, a, a standard score of 79. Notice it's lower than 80 or 85, right? 79. That score on digit span is, is divergent. It's different. So don't add it up. Don't add it or don't include it with arithmetic and letter number sequencing. It's a separate entity unto itself. This actually posits or points to a working memory problem or deficit. And here, at digit span, the student earned a 10, prim <coughs> excuse me, primarily because of digits forward, um, which was really high. And then the working memory was not. And then when they were combined, you got a 10. So you can do, um, you can do whatever you, you, you like on the CHC analyzer. If you wanted to 
Let's say, take a look at auditory working memory from the WJ3. Um, will it combine with letter number sequencing and arithmetic? It does because student earned an 82. Program says, yeah, 82, 80, and 85, these are similar enough, and it creates a composite of 78. So you've got a working memory deficit here of 78 if you include the WJ test. Any questions? Yeah. So if you have, say, uh, for short term memory, whatever, you had a score that was a scale score of 7, 10, and 13, which one of those would be divergent? Probably the 7. It would take the lowest out? Probably. Yeah, because the one of the one of the criterion rules is where on the distribution does it lie. So the two higher ones are like average or better, and the seven is a low average. So we wouldn't do it. It would take the two higher. It's all in the it's in the book. It's a good example. Um, in that case, it would take the two higher ones. Yeah. With the newest five, it doesn't allow you to substitute. I know. Yes, you can. Yeah, on the x pass. Yes. So if you wanted to, you could take any of the tests actually, and, and just you know um, put them in there, and um, and then it'll give give you whether or not you can combine them or not. Because again, the same rules will apply. Um, so you know, I know we're getting towards 11:30. I'm willing to. There's a lot more, and I don't want to cheat you of what you know you're here for. I'm just, I'm willing to keep going. I'm not insulted if you have to leave, you want to leave, but I'll, I'll keep, I'm not going to go all day, <laughs> but you know, I'll go for another half hour if you want to stay. It's not pressure, you don't have to, but you're not going to get, um, you're not even going to get <laughs> what I had planned on showing you in this short period of time. So do you want to stay or? Stay, stay for, you know, you stay as long as you want. I'll go for another half hour. If you need to leave within five, ten minutes or you want to stay a little time, it's fine with me, okay? Um, do you have a question or are you stretching? Can you talk about the PSWP? Yeah, that's what I'm going to get to if it, that's what. I want to get to that, but th this kind of need this too. That's why, and it just takes time. You know, typically this presentation is like six hours and I'm trying to squeeze it into three, so not, not easily done. Um, review of test performance. Just to cut to the chase, that, that jo the Joseph um, case that we're looking at, these are all, uh, all of his scores. Some of them are like um, the actual test score, like a WISC-4 PSI. Some of them are XBA composites and so on. Um, so his performance, I'm just giving you a summary, his performance or his scores, some of them come from you know, the actual index like the PSI, but others are from clinical clusters like the nonverbal clinical cluster on the WIS-4, uh, XBA, you know, that GSM composite that I just showed you, which was letter number sequencing, arithmetic, and the uh, WJ test. Um, that's where that comes from. This is just as an showing you an example, okay? Um, but <clears throat> on the WISC-4, you, you don't have long term retrieval on the WISC-4. It's on the WISC-5, but not on the WISC-4. So you cross battery, you get it from the WJ-3, you get the long term retrieval factor. Um, so you put those scores in, it analyzes it, okay? You also need GA, because you don't have GA on the WISC-4. So you give the WJ-3. Um, that gives you, uh, you, you give the subtest there. The program tells you what the result is. Um, and then you can also give like the phonemic awareness cluster from the WJ. Uh, because the, the reason for referral is a um, basic reading skills problem. So you need the GA and the GLR. So you get it from the, from the WJ3. What I'm trying to, what I'm going to show you is that the program takes all of the data that you have accumulated or you've gathered, whether it's cross-battery, it's test tab, it's whatever, and graphs everything together, okay? And then those data are used in the PSW. Um, so let me see, let me get to this. So <clears throat> we're going to add to our WISC-4 assessment the, the WJ3 GLR factor, the WJ3 phonemic awareness, 
clinical cluster, the auditory attention subtest, the cross battery assessment GC composite, and the cross battery assessment working memory composite. So what we're doing is we, we, the WISC-4 was the core battery, but then we're adding other tests and supplemental um, composites and so on, okay? Uh, you can select whatever you want for graphing. You can do the 68% confidence interval, the 90% confidence interval, or the 95% confidence interval, whichever you're comfortable with, whichever you like to use, okay? You can switch off from one to the other if you like. Um, and now we're, so what we're doing is we're building this, this case, Joseph. Um, these are, again, all of the scores now. Now we are adding the GLR factor, the phonemic awareness factor, the auditory attention subtest, whoops, subtest, and you can see <clears throat> what the graph looks like, okay? So here's your, I think here's all your WISC, your WISC-4 stuff, and then you've got your WJ3 and then your cross-battery composites all laid out on the same graph, okay? Um, and then for Joseph, we gave the Y at three, and so here are his Y at three data, and you add the Y at three data. And so this is the setup for PSWA, for Pattern Strengths and Weaknesses Analysis, right? Because you need your cognitive data, but you need your achievement data. In fact, you really need your achievement data more than your cognitive data to begin with. Um, and <clears throat> so this is the, what you're looking for here is the pattern of strengths and weaknesses. And what, you're going, what we're looking for in our theory, in our thinking, is um, really a dual discrepancy consistency model. Um, the most important part of that is, is the low academic functioning concern, is that performance, that low performance consistent with a cognitive processing deficit that's related to that academic deficit. So it's, it's really, if you think our model can be boiled down to aptitude achievement consistency versus aptitude achievement discrepancy. It's more complicated than that, but in the end, if you've got a low achievement score, and I'm, I'm talking like 75, 78, 82, and a concomitant low score in an ability, a cognitive ability or process that's related to that academic weakness, right? Then you've got some evidence for an aptitude achievement consistency deficit, which for us would lead us to be thinking that there's a specific learning disability. If, however, you've got, let's just say, every cognitive score, neuropsych score is 95 or better, and the basic reading was still 77, let's say, we would say there's no SLD. So there's another explanation for why that student is not doing well in basic reading. It's not due to a cognitive um, deficit or a neuropsych processing deficit or something like that. Same thing, if you've got, <clears throat> um, for us, if there's no academic problem or deficit, then there's no SLD. So I'm just cutting to the chase in terms of our thinking. If, if, if all achievement scores, let's just say, I'm giving an extreme example, but if every achievement score is 95 or better, for us, there's no SLD. I don't care what the cognitive scores are. If there's no academic, if, think about it, if you think about, um, a social emotional problem or, or dis disorder, right? Being sad is not the same as being depressed or clinically depressed, right? You need to have a lot more deficit. You need to be lower functioning in emotion to be classified or to be diagnosed as clinically depressed. You don't need that to be sad, right? So in our thinking, depression is a disorder Sad is just, a, you know, it's like more of a state of being at the moment, or it's like a learning problem. Learning problem is not the same as a learning disability in our thinking, in our mind. So let's just, what's 95, 47th percentile? <clears throat> 42nd. 42nd? So let's say it's 42nd percentile rank, right? 
in our thinking, a, you, you cannot be disabled if you're, if you're at the 42nd percentile. It doesn't make any sense, right? We live in a relative world. It's just the, the world that we live in. So you've got it for us, the student has to have low academic functioning in at least one area to be considered um, SLD. And there has to be concomitant cognitive weakness that's related to that academic area, okay? So, you know, let's just say it's a math problem, just to give you an extreme, you know, and GA is low. Math referral, you've got evidence of a math problem, GA is low, that's not related to math. That's not an aptitude achievement consistency because it's not related. And there's no reading problem, okay? It's got to be related. It's got to be um, a process, a cognitive process or a neuropsych process that's related to that academic area in order to be aptitude achievement consistency. And they have to be low. If they're, if they're high, then for us it's not SLD. It could be something else, but it's not SLD. I'm sorry. Uh, is, is classroom performance taken into yes. account? Everything is taken into account. We never ever say, even though people claim we do, we never ever say that you base you know, your decision on test scores alone. I mean, it's just, that's ridiculous. That's testing. Assessment is very different. And so assessment takes into account interviews, um, work samples, previous um, testing perhaps. What about uh, group administered tests, conversations with the teacher, conversation with the parent, and the best, conversation with the student, <laughs> you know, to find out what's going on with the, with the student from his or her perspective. So no, all that's taken into account. And, you've, you know, we're not, we're not psychometricians, we're psychologists, and there's a big difference. So, you know, we can teach a, a really, you know, high-functioning, you know, primate, like a chimp or whatever, to hit buttons and score a program, but to think about the case, you know, that takes a lot more. So you really need to integrate all sources of data. So we believe in a multi-source, multi-method, and for me, when you're talking about young kids, multi-setting, because kids have probably six or seven personalities, depending on where, they're, where they are. Are they in the mall? Are they in their basement? Are they in the classroom? Are they in the playground? Are they in the park? and they have a different personality depending on where they are, right? So multi-method, multi-source, multi-setting um, approach to assessment. But I'm just rapidly going through our operational definition, which is, we think is pretty decent and pretty good. And we're, I guess if we were to be, I don't know, if we were to be classified in terms of our thinking, we're on the more conservative side. I mean, we do not believe that you know, every kid has LD, you know? I mean, we just don't believe that. Um, and there's probably an overrepresentation of kids who classified as LD, especially among minority groups, um, for a variety of reasons. But you've gotta have that low achievement area to begin with. If you don't have that, see, to me, the assessment should begin with academic achievement. Because if there's no deficit in academic achievement, I'm not sure you need to go beyond that. And I'm, I'm, trust me, and I'm a big advocate of, of school psych and assessment and testing. I'm huge. But if the kid's referred for reading and you've given a really good reading assessment and there's no deficit, then there's no disability. So why do you need to give everything else? If, however, you're on the fence or there isn't a weakness in that academic area, well, then you've got to do your cognitive assessment and you've got to do the assessment based on the reason for referral and the results that you found on the academic achievement. So, just by virtue of being referred, they're being referred for a low academic. So if they're failing in the subject, yeah, but does that mean that they're going to fail with you? Yeah, but does that mean that they're going to fail with you? Yeah, but does that mean that they're going to fail with you? Yeah, but does that mean that they're going to fail with you? There should be a problem, but doesn't mean that there will be. That's all I'm saying. You know? So, okay. Let me get, I'm skipping some of these things. I've said all of this already. Let me get to, uh, oh. So if you can jump ahead to these slides in your handout. This is our model, basically. This is our model of, this is our dual discrepancy consistency model. And it's really what I said to you a moment ago. 
You've got to have, at level one, you've got to have a difficulty in one or more areas of academic achievement, okay? Reading, writing, math, written expression, math calc, one of the eight areas according to IDEIA. <laughs> then at level two, you have to, um, SLD does not include a learning problem that's a result of visual, hearing, or motor disabilities. Those are your exclusionary factors. You've got to have the rule out. If the academic, if you have an academic deficit and that deficit is due to some other reason, motor impairment, intellectual disability, um, socioeconomic uh, situation, poverty, you know, then if that's the primary reason for the academic deficit, then it's not SLD. People forget about that. Level three, a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological or neuropsychological processes. If you've got evidence of an academic weakness, you've ruled out all the other um, possibilities, then you need to, to see, well, does this student perform poorly in a cognitive ability or process that's related to that academic area? So you have to make sure you tailor your assessment. Um, and then the specific learning disability is a condition differentiated from general learning failure. Um, by general, uh, uh, generalized learning failure by generally average or better ability to think and reason and a learning profile exhibiting significant variability indicating processing areas of strengths and weakness. Basically, you need to have low academic functioning, you need to rule out exclusionary factors, you need to have a cognitive processing or neuropsych processing deficit that's related to the academic area of concern but you also, the rest of the cognitive profile needs to be average or better. That's what we mean by an otherwise normal ability profile. In other words, because if you've got low functioning in all cognitive areas, that's not SLD. That might be intellectual disability or even worse, because we don't have services, a slow learner. So we believe wholeheartedly that there's a difference between SLD, intellectual disability, I'm going to fall off this platform, SLD and, um, what did I just say, and slow learner, okay? Differences among those three. SLD, what's the S stand for? Specific, right? It's a circumscribed deficit. A student can be, have LD in reading and writing, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is SLD is different from intellectual disability, which is different from slow learner. So you need to have that academic deficit, a cognitively related deficit, all of, not all, most other cognitive areas need to be within normal limits, and you need to rule out those other possibilities. Then you can move forward with your decision um, about SLD. If you don't have those, you can't even get to the point of saying that the student is, um, has a specific learning disability. So this is basically what I just kind of just said. You've got to have that average ability, right? You've got to have that average ability, overall ability, but you need a cognitive weakness or deficit you need an academic weakness or deficit, failure, and the weakness, the cognitive weakness and the academic weakness have to be consistent and they have to be related. It's, it's these three ovals are gonna appear in everything or anything you read that we produce. So now here's the PSWA, which is quite <clears throat> involved, um, but it's based on everything I just said. This is the identifying information page, cross battery, pattern, strengths and weaknesses analyzer. You need to know the grade of the student. Um, and uh, of course, you'll, you'll do the age and all that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> the first thing that you have to do, and this is the hard part, is you have to determine whether the student's functioning in the seven CHC ability areas, GC, F, LR, all the way down to GS, these seven, these are all the more cognitive um, broad ability domains, <clears throat> not GRW or GQ, <clears throat> but the seven 
more cognitive ability or neuropsych domains, GC all the way down to GS. These, where do these scores come from? These are Joe's scores <coughs> that we, we saw a little earlier. You have to determine whether or not an ability is considered sufficient when it is judged by the evaluator to contribute meaningfully to the individual's overall cognitive functioning, particularly for the purpose of facilitating academic performance. Typically, standard scores around 90 or higher are sufficient as abilities associated with scores in this range often contribute meaningfully to the individual's overall cognitive functioning and therefore support learning. When standard scores are around 90 or lower, clinical judgment is necessary. So what are we asking you to do in English? These are Joe's scores, okay? Well, these are the ones that we decided to put in here. You need to determine as the evaluator, is, this, is the score in this area, in this area, and so on, <laughs> I come from Brooklyn, is there enough stuff there? In other words, is, do you believe that that score is, is a good enough score, right, that you can say, yeah, this score in this area is okay in helping this student learn, all right, or not? So for, in this case, the 92, the 93, the 100, the 97, the 102, we're saying basically those functions are intact for this individual. They are sufficient. He or she he has enough of that stuff, okay, that he's okay in that area. And that that function, that ability assists in learning. The 79 and the 80, which is GF and GA, those are low. Those, those are deficit functioning. Those are not intact. Those are not sufficient. Those are circumscribed cognitive weaknesses that may be having an inhibiting effect on that student's learning, okay? So why do you need all of this? You need all of this, well, in this case, by the way, memory span is okay. Remember, it was a 10, but working memory, we created an XBA composite of, um, I think it was 78 or something like that. Um, is, is deficient, and you'll see where that comes up. But why do you need to do all that? Because the program creates what's called a G value. The G value reflects the overall cognitive ability based on the CHC abilities judged by you to be sufficient. The G value is based on these green the, the numbers in green, it's not the numbers, it's based on the G weights that come from um, the program embedded in, uh, the, the formula embedded in the program, okay? Remember I said to you, GF and GC are really important, right? Okay, you think about an overall IQ score. On some IQ tests, WJ is the best example, the, there's a different weighting for GF, for GC, for GSM, for GLR, that goes into the overall score. There's a different weighting. It just means that there's more importance for certain abilities than for others. In every study, in every analysis, GF and GC are always the top two. Not always GF, GC, sometimes GC, GF. They're always the top two. <clears throat> that G, that overall score, is a combination of whatever goes into it. And whenever GF and GC go into it, they account for more variability than the other, um, ab the other factors or the other abilities. Does that make sense? It's, that, it's just that they count more, right? They contribute more to G. So um, that's what the G value is here. It's saying take the, take the abilities that are sufficient take the G weights, which we have embedded in the program, which are based on a median of several factor analyses, take those weights, add them up, and when you add them up, in this case, you get a G value of 0.86. Well, what does that mean in English? How likely is it that the individual's pattern of strengths indicates at least overall cognitive ability? Well, it's likely 
Despite the presence of weaknesses in one or more cognitive ability domains, which are um, GF and what did we say, GA, okay, the individual displays average or better functioning in cognitive ability domains considered important for acquiring the academic skills typical for this grade level. The individual's overall cognitive ability is very likely to be average or better and therefore ought to enable learning and achievement, especially when specific cognitive weaknesses are minimized. Okay? In English, this student has enough stuff to benefit from intervention, instruction, whatever you want, word you want to use. It's likely that this person is going to benefit from that. We know this is controversial, but it's clear. If you don't have GF and GC, you're going to struggle. So what this does is says, based on the areas that you say are intact, what's the likelihood that an individual possesses at least overall average cognitive ability? Why do we stress overall average cognitive ability? Because since 19, before any of us was born, SLD has been, the definition has included average overall intellectual ability. So what the G value tells you is, does your student have that average intellectual ability? The other score that's important is this one, or value is this one, a 96. That's called the intact ability estimate. What's the intact ability estimate? Well, now you'll really freak out, right? Intact ability estimate is the 92, 93, 100, 97, and 102 are entered into a formula with median realiabilities and median inter, inter uh, correlations. <clears throat> and I'll say it, it's like an IQ score without the 80 and the 79. So the intact ability estimate is it's like a, it takes the scores that you say are good in green and in a formula combine them and then tell me what that value is. So it's as if you took out, let's say you know, you're doing the WISC-4, here you go. The GAI on the WISC-4 does not include the working memory index or the PS, right? The process, it's the same thing here. You're just saying, what's, take, tell me what's in, I'm going to tell you what's intact. You tell me what that IQ score would be. Use the reliabilities and the intercorrelation. So the intact ability estimate, 96, is really sort of an average of the, almost like an average of the green values, right? So you're taking out the fluid reasoning and the auditory processing. You're saying, well, what would the IQ be like if you took those out, right? Well, it's a 90, it would be like a 96. And then the G value is that weighting, OK? Um, the G value, these two are highly related, but not always um, the same, because the G value is based on the weights, and those weights do not change depending on the student or whatever. Whatever you say is sufficient. The values of GF and GC always stay the same. But these values can change, and then that'll change the IAE, or the Intact Ability Estimate. Where's the 78? That's your working memory deficit. That's that XBA composite that we came up with, right? Because working memory was a problem. <clears throat> and then the 75 is a score on basic reading skills from the Wyatt. It's a basic reading skills score and it's a 75. So what, so what I'm laying out for you here is, yeah, this person, yeah, high probability that he has an overall average ability, um, he has overall average ability. What's, his, what's a good estimate of his ability when you take out the deficit areas? Well, it's around 96 or so. But he's got a circumscribed weakness in working memory. That's a cognitive process, neuropsych process, 78. And we have the 75, the weakness in basic reading, which is a 75. So what the program does, um, it says, based on the 96, 
right? That intact ability estimate. What would you predict working memory to be? Well, working memory was predicted to be 97. Based on that 96, what should the basic reading score be? About 97, because the closer you are to 100, whenever you're predicting something, if they're highly related, you ex expect something very similar. This is your old aptitude achievement discrepancy, by the way. Here's your cognitive score, and here's your achievement score, right? That's the old aptitude achievement discrepancy, but that's not enough. You need that domain-specific weakness. So here's your, your IQ score without GF and without GA, and what should working memory be? What should GSM be based on that? Well, it should be around a 97, but the student actually earned a 78, right? That is an 18.76 difference. Critical value is 9.24. That meets the criterion of domain-specific. What that means is that, yeah, there's a, cog there's a cognitive area that's significantly weaker than his or her other, his or her IQ, if you will, or intact ability estimate. Whoops, sorry. Over here, you have a basic reading score of 75, is predicted to be 97. That's a 22 point difference. Critical value is 16.5. That's under, unexpected underachievement. With this kind of score, he should be earning a higher score in basic reading. He is not, it's a 75. So now you've got two parts covered for SLD, but here's the most important one, if you will, right? It's 78 and a 75. Actual, actual. He had, he earned a 78 on working memory and a 75 on basic reading skills. These are both low scores. Is there a below average aptitude achievement consistency? Yes, there is. 78 and 75. They're both below average. They're consistent. And now you've met that achieve, aptitude achievement consistency criterion. Is the program showing, is the program comparing that those are actually related areas though? Um, no, you're doing that. But that's a great question because on the XBAS, we actually include the relationship. Um, that was an addition that we add. Is it a moderate relationship, a weak relationship, or a high relationship? Something like that. <clears throat> and so it'll help you in that thinking. But you're right, in this version, no. It's just you, you're determining you know, that. Look, you know what? I always said this, and I'll say it until I die. If you want a kid to be L, um, SLD, you, you have the magic to do it. You can pick any scores you want. You want to do difference from grade level. You want to do simple difference method. You want to pick the high IQ score and the low achievement score. You know, go to a different state, you'll meet the criteria somewhere, right? It's just, <clears throat> or a different school district, and you'll meet the criteria. It, you can make a kid SLD. That's not what we're saying. You know, we don't say do this five times until you, five SLD, until you find it. We're saying think. You know, use cross battery assessment, use CHC theory, think ahead of time, reason for referral, your other assessment data before you get to this point. Then make your decision, you know, which, what you want to put in there. We would say you can run this like two times, because let's say you have more, another uh, cognitive weakness. Well, you may want to run it again with that as well. But once you've got, once you meet the criteria, then you've got, you should have enough evidence for, for SLD. Yeah? Right. And so, you know, if I don't know what the critical values are for, say, example, the academic, right. why would I want to run it like two or three or four times to see if I meet Well, the only reason is because we don't have a correction for multiple comparisons, which means the more times you, the more times you look for a problem, the greater the probability you'll find one. So, right, I always say that about relationships. You know what? If you're with your partner, if you want to pick a fight, you'll find something to pick a fight about, right? Same thing here. If you want to find SLD, you can, you can probably find it if you put the right scores in. But we just caution about doing it too many times because, um, because we don't have the correction for multiple comparisons. But 
you know, if you've got two weak areas, it's okay to try it either way and see, see where you come at. Again, program's not making the decision, you are, and you're basing it on a lot more information than the program has. So, you know, so that's, that's the crux of, of, of the PSWA. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, there's probably 50, 60, 70 more slides on PSWA, but that's the nutshell of it, right? It's aptitude, achievement, consistency, but you've got to have a cognitive weakness that's related to the academic weakness. And the cognitive weakness has to be significantly different from that ability estimate, and so does the uh, achievement weakness. So, um, let me see what, yeah, this is all the printout, and then the slides here talk about um, the justification. <clears throat> so, I just have a few more, I'll get through this quickly. Identification of SLD involves more than just examining scores from standardized tests, I said that. Um, we have an exclusionary factors form, it's on the CD. So, if you want to like, this is the rule out, vision, hearing, motor, adaptive functioning, social emotional functioning, it's kind of like a social history. So. You can print it out and use it as many times as you want, photocopy it, whatever you want. Um, we have a flow chart that um, it's actually in the XFAST, but it helps you determine what scores to be entered into the PSWA. Um, it's a psychometrically sound, we believe it's psychometrically sound, the PSWA. It's a clinical tool, etc. Individual differences are important. Um, to test or not te to test is the wrong question. Rather than abandoning our tools, practitioners need to learn how to integrate assessment for intervention. Um, and um, Delatopolo says RTRI or response to the right intervention, right? So it's not just RTI, it's a response to the right intervention. And then are we teachers, psychologists, diagnosticians? You know, school psychology swings, a pendulum swings from more school to more psychology, back to school. I mean, we're always a discipline in, in flux, but. Um, I always read this, I'm not gonna read it today, but basically, Gil Trackman, grandfather of school psych in New York, basically said, you know, before we give up the role of assessment, you know, we should think twice. So, we're big proponents of assessment, not necessarily testing, but assessment, and if we give that role away, we're gonna give our jobs away, so. Um, Alan Kaufman, who lives not too far from here in La Jolla, we are the most important element in evaluation, not the tests themselves, right? So we're the ones who make the diagnosis and we base it hopefully on the best data that we can collect for an individual student.